Ko tō ringa kaha ki ringa ki ingi tuhei te pōta tau te whero whero te tuwhiti o te ki tōna whare. Ki nga panina pauri nga rawa kore, ki a tātou katoa i roto i tēnei ao mate mate. Ke mau te aroha, te whakapono, te tika. Me tō ō whiwhinga, ō rawinga, tūturua whiti whakamaua ki a tīna. Tīna, hau mea hui e, tāi ki e. Thank you. Nō rere huri otu, huri oku whakaro hoki ki a rātou māku a henga ko weha atu ki te rātua ata arai, haere, haere o te atu rā. Ana reira apiti hono tātai hono rātou ngā hunga mate ki a rātou, apiti hono tātai hono tātou ngā kānohi wara ki a rātou. Ka huri anō ki a koutou ka tōko a tai i rotu a tāhe tō tātou whare i tēnei wā, nau mai haere mai. Nau mai hara mai ngā rangatira o Waikato Tainui, Ko kawe mai o koutou mana, ki koutou mai ki wangangui a mātou. Nō reira, nau mai hara mai ki raro i te koro ai o te rangi mārie, me tahau honga rongo ki, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Ki a koutou katoa, ngā rangatira i o te waikato tainui ki ronga i te pūrangi, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou. Ki a koutou hoku ka nō hoki ngā... Ngā kaunihira rohe o Waikato, ngā memo o te kaunihira rohe o Waikato e noho mai nei i te tehu, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Ko reira kaore e roa oku nei kore roa i tēnei ata koe anō, ka nui te mehi o te kaunihira ki a koutou katoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. O tēnei te mehi ki a kōrua Don, rawa kō Neville, ki a tūwhera tō tātou hui. Um, we've got a bit of a run sheet here and welcoming Barry to his own whare as the, um, the new co-chair of, of our committee. And so I wonder if we can just quickly go around the room, introduce us, who we are, what our role is. I know there's a lot of people online, so we'll do those in the room first um, and, and then we'll go online and then uh, go to Barry to, to introduce himself and um, the new vision that he has is in, in his role. So I'll start. Kia ora koutou, ko Jackie Collier, tōku ingoa. Um, I'm a member of Te Aratauda and I'm from Tanifa Marae, which is uh, where Pamela represents um, in Wairinga Waitiremu. Kia ora. Jocelyn. Uh, kia ora, Justin Berman, tōku ingoa. Uh, I sit in Whakakitinga and I'm also from Te Kauri Marae. Uh, kia ora, Pamela Storey, councillor uh, for the Waikato Regional Council, representing the Waikato constituency. Uh, kia ora, Don Turner, uh, member of Te Aratauda and from Taupiri Marae. Kia ora, Don. Kia ora, Jennifer Nicol. Um, I represent the community of Hamilton Kirikiriroa on the Waikato Regional Council and also lead the Climate Action Committee. Morena tēnā tātou, ko nō mne o ahau, nō te ao pito ki rāho i pokeka tēnei, ko kai tomi tūmi te marae, i memo o te whakaitinga o Waikato. Te mari, te pa mahu te wahi pā ngā te mahuta, here is Councillor for the Ngā Hauewha Constituency, te tū. Kia ora. Kia ora tātou, ko Neville Williams tōku e ngoa, he kai mahi a hau mā te kauri he rāro he o Waikato. Kia ora tātou, ko Mali Ahipine a hau, hau tū hono Waikato Regional. Kia ora tātou, ko Mark Tamaro tōku e ngoa, Director of Regional Transport Connections at Waikato Regional Council.
Kia ora, so James had just asked if we could have the WRC staff online introduce themselves, starting with um, with you, Chris McClay. Yeah, kia ora tato. Uh, ko, Chris McClay ho, uh, Chief Executive, Waikato Regional Council. Angela? Uh, thank you. Uh, kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Angela James Tuku Ingua. Um, I'm one of the councillors at uh, Waikato Regional Council, representing uh, Hamilton and Kirikiri Roa. Yeah. Anna? First one of the day, mic's off. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> Kia ora te whāna, ko Anna Rose, Solomon Banks, ahai. Ko te ranga waiwai tōku marae. Uh, ko ai te kai hāpai hōtaka mā tauranga for Waikato Regional Council. Nā mahi. Kia ora, Bruce. Kia ora, good morning. Bruce McAuliffe, um, Policy Manager, Waikato Regional Council. Danielle? Uh, kia ora mai tātou, ko Danielle Marks, tōku i ngoa, he rio, nō te arawa, tu whare toa whi tonga hoki, he kai whakaritia. Kia ora, Johnny. Kia ora, Johnny. Kia ora, Johnny. Kia ora tātou, he uri no paupiri i tani pātou mō rāinga te mōri te te reapu. I mahi ana au i no te reo pa tārangu whenua. Te kau nuki, kia ora. And we've got Gavin Donald. Oh, tēnā koutou, ko Gavin Donald tōku ingoa. Here on behalf today in my role as Project Managing Freshwater Policy Review and also contributing to the Mata Ranga Māori uh, section of the Three Waters Business Case. Thank you. Angus? Uh, Morena tātou. Uh, Angus Koe Toku Ingoa. I'm a policy advisor in the Freshwater Policy Mahi here at the Regional Council. Kia ora. I think we're getting close. Kia ora, Rangi Māori. Morena, uh, tēnā rā tātou, uh, ko Rangi Māori mahui ka tōku ingoa. Uh, he uri o Ngāti Rangi Wuhi o te rāro anō. Uh, he kai tōhu tōhu au i rotu i a tairanga whenua. Kia ora. Is there anyone else from Regional Council who hasn't introduced themselves? I'm a uh, chair. Uh, Fred Lichwak is. He doesn't oh, have Fred. a speaker down, a microphone down there, but Councillor Fred Lichwak. Out of my Fred. Just moving over to Waikato Tainui people. Aroha mai moana. I've just seen you on on James's um, iPad. If you want to introduce yourself, Moana. Moana is um, an observer member of of the the committee. Kia ora. Tēnā tātou, ko Moana no Kia ora. Kia ora Moana. Alana? Kia ora, ko Alana mako tōku ingoa uh, in the Tai Ao team at Waikato Tainui. Te reinga? Uh, Waikato, and I am a policy advisor for the Waikato Tainui team. Kia ora. The only other person I can see is Mara. Morena kaitau, ngā mihi maha na kia kaitau katoa, ko marae tūkere tōku ingoa, ko tiranga wāwai tōku marae. I'm acting tumu whakarai for Waikato Tainui. Is there anyone else from Waikato Tainui online that hasn't introduced themselves? Manaki. Oh, I don't Kia ora tātou. 
was trying to get away with it. Oh, Jackie hasn't seen me, so I won't. Uh, but uh, Morena Tato, Komanaki Nipi o Toku Ingoa, he uri a hau no Waikato, uh, ko e te kaimahi ki Waikato Tainui. Tēnā tato. Kia And finally, over to you, uh, Mr. Kochia. Ko Barry Quail, a uh, hau. Um, Itakai Whakaiti uh, Tēnā Koe. Uh, Tiwahi Naru, uh, Kingi Tahitia, uh, Ti Ti Tohonga Mati, Ki Timahi, Ki Timahi, Ki Timahi, in a mana, in a reo, ro rangatirama, Tenakota. You know, it is my great privilege to stand here before you in a co-chair role. I regard this as most significant as part of my journey. And uh, normally you'd come into a bit of a pipiha here, and I want to just express a bit of the history of the connection and the thread that I've had with Tainui and the Kingi Tanga because I think that's appropriate to set the boundary of where we are going to be going together. So it's, it's not lost on me that it's 17 years since the settlement uh, between the Crown, almost to the day. It was a few days out, I understand, it's around about that time. So that's very significant to me uh, because it is part of our journey going forward and the council is part of that journey. I want to express that this journey with this council started really quite early. Uh, I was privileged to be one of the first five, uh, inverted commas, staff that joined this regional council in 1990. At that regional council, I had the post of Executive Director, Waikato Regional Development Board. On that board was Kingi Tanga representative. And the, the mana and the work that we did jointly on that board back at that time really stood me in good stead for moving forward. So to me, that was the start of the journey. The day is about co-governance, and I see the whole steps of how we've moved forward. So it is the utmost importance to me that our relationship is genuine, uh, trustworthy, and recognising a genuine commitment to co-governance. You know, the Regional Council has a commit commitment, if I may sit, uh, to being a bona fide agent of the Crown under the treaty settlement. That is a requirement on this council. We will do that to the best of our ability. We are committed to to mana o to why, which is being embedded in our policies and our governance policy. To me, to mana o to why personally is absolutely logical and it should underpin everything we do. It, you know, I wonder why it wasn't really brought forward into this realm much earlier, because it, it makes every bit of sense. I want to bring a genuine relationship with Tainui. Uh, I'm going further than the River Trust here because I think it's important to, to underpin where we are. Because Tainui is a principal player and an influencer in the environment of this region, being in a genuine relationship in regard to Tainui and the region's economic development issues, we are doing with and through Tawaka. It was an initiative that I pushed very hard through council myself with the support of my councillors. We have been able to drive this because council machinery is not the best in driving economic development. So hence to Waka can engage more actively in that space. We also are 
meaningfully engaging on planning and strategy matters. There's a lot of work going on. So a little bit of, just a little bit about me, not a pippy har, but uh, I was born in Hastings, Havelock North, I uh, lived on the side of Tomata Peak, um, a really nice part of the world. Went to Wellington for 15 years, and in Wellington I was involved with Nawasco. And for those who are a bit longer in the tooth, that was the National Water and Soil Conservation Organisation, which fitted under the Ministry of Works. So I had my grounding, if you like, in a, in a lot of those areas, which water quality was a matter that I was concerned with and involved in my work in those days. I then was involved with the National Roads Board, which is the forerunner to Waka Kotahi, and I was secretary of the Wellington District Roads Council. That, that really was about engagement with communities because in those days government engaged with the community and and then advanced uh, in that case roading and other initiatives which was in a very much a joint way with the mayors and and the representatives of the local so over many years my personal involvement with and the threads that i have with tainui and Kingi Tanga, I think it might be useful to you to set that boundary. In 1986, I came from Wellington to Huntley, probably the best decision I made, because that put me in a community that enabled me to connect with Kingi Tanga and with Tainui. And I was absolutely privileged, and I still um, in awe, I didn't think how important it was at the time, but I was in the kitchen with Dame Tiara Rangikahu having a chat to establish initial relationships. It paid off in a number of ways. Firstly, the government, and I had some warning of this, but the public servants didn't, the government of the day corporatised state coal mines. What that meant for that community was there was no well-being in those days. Well-being was not on the agenda of the government. It was about if, if they thought your books didn't look right, that was the end of that business. And so state coal mines, within a matter of weeks, was wound up. And all the people, it was 40% of Huntley was unemployed. The government did zilch in terms of supporting those people. So I was uh, then left, even though I was offered a job with State, it was uh, Coal Corp, they called it, I decided to leave. Uh, by the way, when I was working for State Coal Mines, I had a job which was in charge of all the surface workings of the whole of, and all the land and all of the, about 40% of the housing through Huntley. The reason for that, the importance of that, is you're connecting with people. So uh, where I went to from there was I was engaged by the Huntley Borough Council and formed a close relationship with Bob Tookery in that council. Uh, we looked at economic and, and well-being matters, which wasn't even a word you know, broadcast in those days. So we looked at that to take the community forward. So I connected uh, and I regard Huntley as very important in my development. And then I went to the Waikato Regional Development Board here based one of the first entities under the Regional Council. And, I, and I've mentioned that. One of the next steps that was most important was joining field days and uh, the development of the relationship of field days and the university. The field days and the university became very closely entwined. Why was that important in terms of Kingi Tanga and uh, Tainui? Because I met Bob Mahuta there and spent some time, usually on a Friday night in a social gathering where I could interact with him and uh, my admiration for the skill, the intellect, and the capability, 
he is undervalued in terms of what he did for not only the people of Tainui, but for the whole of the country because he, he created, was at the forefront of change. I saw that. That impacted me. Uh, here is a man of considerable skill and ability. He influenced governments. So, again, that was part of the growth of my personal understanding. What then happened was post a settlement, there was um, uh, a contact made. I had initiated the opening of the second part of the Mystery Creek Event Centre, which was the uh, convention centre, which was really ahead of its time. So I wanted to tell you that essentially at that point, Dame Tiada made a contact with me and requested that could she launch the base at that one event. Now, what was the base? I had no idea what the base was about, but because I had this personal request, I had to do the right thing there. Uh, the next the next thing was to, how did we do that? Well, we had a 36-piece orchestra playing a piece of music, which was the first music to identify the Waikato River. It was written about the Waikato River. It was played by this orchestra. And at the same time, we had a 24-person waka come through the room with Tainui warriors in it, lit up with the lights inside it, floating on a bed of dry ice. The people don't know how it got in the room and it went out through the wall. They don't know even how it left, but it was very moving uh, in terms of uh, this whole. The editor of the Waikato Times was there and said, front page next day, this was the most, that was, he was blown away, it was the most understated event he'd ever attended. Uh, and it had Tainui sweeps the floor, you know, at words to the effect that it elevated the mana of Tainui in terms of this region at a level that hadn't been at that time. Again, I was pleased to be part of that. So that's just a little bit of getting a feeling of my journey and what, where I'm here today and how I see personally taking the relationship and my understanding and the values I see in working with the Kingitanga and the people and through this committee with Tainui and advancing the cause, which is about environment, people and economy next. So those are very important. But I want to read a statement to you all. Um, and this, the reason I'm reading a statement, I don't want to miss any critical point. The Waikato Regional Council, its staff and councillors have worked hard to build constructive, respectful and meaningful relationships with iwi Māori uh, throughout our region. In the context of today, I'd like to acknowledge our iwi partners, Waikato Tainui, and also the important role of Kingitanga, not just within the Waikato, but as an enduring expression of Māori unity. These relationships are increasingly important, however. Recent failings on our behalf have put a strain on relationships, and I acknowledge that. I understand that staff met yesterday with the King's office in the Waikato Tonoe, and that an apology was extended for any offence and hurt caused by our actions at the opening ceremony of this building. I have to say at that point, I really am apologising personally myself. I could not be at that function and I was not here in the days leading up to that function. I should have been able to apply my extensive knowledge in event management and protocols and dealing with, as I learnt a lot through the field days, because we had uh, leaders, we had ambassadors, we had governor generals and we had prime ministers and so on every year, including Dame Teata. And, and so I was not able to apply that and I regret I wasn't able to apply that to the opening of this building. And, and certainly it was an embarrassment personally to me that I was 
uh, absent uh, from that. So we have now led with that meeting, uh, we have now led to a commitment to work together to ensure we, the council, do not fail in the same manner again. Governors too must demonstrate sincere regret and so on behalf of the regional council governors, I apologise. Councillors are committing to growing our te ao Māori capability, understanding the importance of te riti and working on realising genuine partnerships in the Māori context. We are very much look forward to a future opportunity to extend our knowledge of the Kingitanga and thank the King's Office for the generosity demonstrated in making such an offer. So I see this today as a step change in the way we're going to work together and the way we're, we're making the subtle changes that will occur, but there's very significant ones. Because only together can we continue to lead in terms of environment, in terms of well-being and people and this, the economy of this region. So with that, uh, Noarera, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Atoa. Tenakoe Barry. Well, firstly, just want to acknowledge the experience and um, history that you bring to this table and really, um, I guess, the connection that you also have with the Kingitanga and leaders past and, and present. I really, you know, appreciate the sincerity in, in your corridor um, and the expression of desire to want to build on our relationship and really work in a you know, meaningful treaty-based um, partnership way. Um, and I think what's come through to me in your corridor is that there's uh, appears to be, you know, a pretty close alignment in terms of values and what's driving us and the order of those those things too. Um, you know, te mano te whenua, te mano te wai, te mano te tangata. Um, def, you know, certainly appreciate your acknowledgement of the mano of our king and of the kingi tanga and of not Waikato Tainui as a, an entity, but of our people and the place that we have in, in this rohe. Um Really looking forward to, I guess, the time that we do have left in your current term and how we might be able to put some real mechanisms in place to make those words a reality and have um, have that endure through the council in terms of the culture of council. Thank you for your apology. Um, it is refreshing and certainly um, acknowledged the sincerity of, of the apology. And um, as you've noted, we did have a hui yesterday. So uh, with Chris and Neville and Mali um, and Tingira, uh, myself and, and Donald. And so that was a great start, a great start of, of a conversation. And what we uh, one of the things that we came away from that hui um, as, as an action, something to follow up, was really needing to elevate that corridor to a, a governance level, so with the likes of yourself. Um, and there were a few other actions around um, identifying things that can be done to uh, try and repair the, the mamai, try and repair the hurt, but start to embed some of the historical... Um, or the history of the kingitanga and the raupatu and the impact that that's had on us in your in your culture and in your training, but also you know where we're going as an iwi and what our um, our aspirations are um, as as a people. So again, just thank you, Barry. Looking forward to probably one more meeting um, before before your election. Um, I guess we'd normally have a have a cup of tea, but it's a bit of a mixed. Mixed attendance here, so I, I suggest that we, we carry, on, carry on. Carry on with our hui. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so moving to the next part of our agenda, just call for apologies. Um, we've got one from Kataraina. I'd like to uh, table Huirama Matatahi's apology and uh, Tuku Roirangi Morgan's apology as well. 
And Tip is um, just noted early depart. Oh, yourself, Tip? Or, yeah. Top point. Okay. Tip a move. Can I, Donald second. All in favour? Aye. Right. I'm moving quickly to confirmation of agenda. I've got no requests for changes. Anyone else? We've got a presentation from that Mara and Manaki will present um, as a as a filler, a gap filler, and we will circle back with that particular co papa. Um, to give these stories to the whole of council, not just the JMA committee, so that they all have the benefit of that story. Um, so just noting, wanting to receive the presentation, but wanting the whole council to receive it. And Dangi Māori is online, who's in uh, responsible mm. for the training. Yeah. So I think yes to today, but yes, yes to the council getting the same presentation at some point. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we talked about yesterday at Ahui was we've got many, many wonderful historians and orators within our iwi um, who can be called upon to provide that um, that training as, as a service. Um, and that should be embedded in the, I guess, the cultural training program. I think for today, we were really just responding to a request to give a once over lightly of the impacts of Raupatu. But to do that well requires much more, yeah, much more um, and another thing that we discussed yesterday was how do we capture that corridor so it's useful for the wider community and other, you know, partners. So it's not a do something with regional council, then Norman's then doing something repeat, for Hamilton repeat, City. Repeat. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, just on that point, Dangi Māori, you've heard that view, um, and we've spoken to you about including iwi. Just wanted to give you an opportunity if you want to speak into that at the moment. Um, yeah, I know that um, we also have uh, the uh, an internal um, cultural competency review going on at the moment, and so um, we've talked about the possibility of creating some long term. Um, we've got some long term options that we're looking at in terms of um, maybe hopefully working with iwi to develop some online courses that we can utilize and maybe they could be shared across other platforms. But yeah, um, we're quite we're really keen to be able to do the best that we can to work with our iwi partners to be able to support your guys narratives as well. So yeah, kia ora. So th thank you for reminding me to, that um, we do have a replacement for Tuku as he sent his apologies and Mara and Manaki will provide a, a different um, presentation just to um, share what we're we are focused on. So with that change, um, can I get a mover to accept our agenda? Can I just add, a, I'm sort of just hearing, just through the chairs, <clears throat> is that a combined possible induction or for next, we're, we're coming to the end of a term? A term. Yeah. And so the, the strategy might be that it, it, it's an induction that's created together with Waikato Tainui and Waikato Regional Council. For yeah, the definitely. Future. And I think we should take uh, benefit from the regional councillors questions of the current council, because that will only help the induction for the, mm. when we onboard those new people, I think. Yeah. You know. But importantly, I think the point noted is that it's got to go beyond the JMA committees, the, the, the learning. Mm. Yeah, point now. Kia ora. So I've got Jen as a mover, Norman as a seconder. All in favour? Carried. Any disclosures of interest? Donald? Yeah, just a um, member of Te Huia, uh, the JMA, HCC and WDC. No others? We can have that recorded. Don't need to move that, do we? No, can't buy. Um, so just confirmation of previous minutes. I've got a, um, a requested change. 
please. Uh, so just 1A, page 6, um, just uh, co-chair Russ delivered his um, apology. I didn't accept that. If we can just make that amendment, please. And uh, I'd just like to note, um, I did apologise to Jocelyn Berryman. Uh, the agenda papers that went out, not so much the minutes, had the spelling error again. I just want to apologise for that. And we've now got an assurance, we've got our ducks in a row going forward. So uh, apologies for that. So with those amendments, tippers moving. Norman, second. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Carried. That moves us to our substantive item on the agenda. Impact of, oh, sorry, public transport governance. Mark Tamuda. Thank you, Madam Chair, for making some time on this agenda. It's something that I've been keen to share with uh, Waikato Tainui for um, a little while since the review's been underway, but I know that um, uh, agendas are precious time, and so thanks for making time on this, on this particular one. Um, what I will hope to do, if it's OK with you, Madam Chair, is that I will step through a presentation. I'll try and keep it as short as possible. And, um, and leave as much time as I can for questions um, from the committee. Um, so the Public Transport Business Improvement Review, um, looks like there's a slight delay in the slides, but I'll, I'll keep going, they'll catch up. Um, the Public Transport Business Improvement Review was a review commissioned by Waikato Regional Council um, really in recognition that we had some fundamental system challenges with achieving what it is that, uh, that we all wanted to achieve in respect of public transport. Because we know that we have to make more efficient use of our transport corridors, in particular in urban areas. We know that we need to do better at con connecting people and communities. And we know that we have to reduce transport emissions. Um, but we've really struggled uh, uh, we are starting to really reach the edges of what our current operating model enables us to do. And so the Regional Council commissioned a review, um, and these are some things that the review found. Um, one really important thing was that in respect of a, uh, the direction of travel or the vision for public transport, there is far, far less debate about the merits and benefits of public transport, both in an urban context and also for connecting communities outside of urban areas. And, uh, and so um, the, the vision for public transport was really, um, really was very consistent and is consistent with almost any policy document you read that relates to transport or public transport these days. But progress is challenging. Um, patronage performance has struggled when we're talking about patronage, we're a number of people on seats and we all know some of the reasons why that is. Um, but it's not only because of the last uh, the things that have struck us over the last couple of years. Um, it's increasingly uh, because um, it's increasingly because uh, journeys on public transport are uh, are, um, are challenged in terms of their their efficiency and their convenience as a mode of travel relative to other modes, in particular cars. Um, and we all know the best thing that you can do, um, or the thing that will most likely drive your choice of way of getting around is what's going to get me where I need to go, when I need to go, and how quickly can it get me there, and how comfortably can it get me there. Um, the funding framework is pretty complicated. Uh, in Waikato, we operate a mixed funding model where the Regional Council raises the local share of public transport funding. Um, via its regional council rating in the city area. Uh, and the rest of the region, territorial authorities um, raise the rates. Um, there's one exception to that coming up soon. 
um, and those funds are passed through to the regional council. And you can imagine that that makes it very difficult to plan for and fund an integrated network where people will want to journey across territorial boundaries. Um, uh, there's also obviously Waka Kotahi, who provide the other part of the uh, half of the net cost of um, public transport. And there are other players increasingly um, investing in public transport. Um, the nation, uh, we have this uh, perennial challenge with the split between infrastructure and operations. You can't operate a good public transport system without good public transport infrastructure. There's no point having good public transport infrastructure if you don't have good public transport services. Um, those infrastructure and services are managed by territorial authorities or road controlling authorities on the one hand and the services by the regional council. And um, I don't need to tell you too much about what COVID-19 has done to public transport. The report came up with three or recommendations that I've broken into three categories. Uh, practical actions, new tools and institutional changes. And it's probably on the last that I think the majority of your interest will lie. But in respect of practical actions, one of the things that we found very encouraging by the report was that actually it was telling us, make sure you're doing a whole bunch of stuff that we're already doing. And this was looking at, you know, not just New Zealand, this was looking at international comparators in terms of benchmarking, things like electronic ticketing, real-time information, and moving to more frequent core routes, um, such as uh, uh, such as the Meteor service, such as the Comet, um, and, uh, and soon to be, uh, soon around the corner, we hope, um, a service connecting Rotatuna. Um, uh, there are other things also happening on the territorial authority side, uh, for example, the in, embedded within many local transport strategies, uh, most recently Waipa District Council looking to its own transport strategy, looking at things like bus priority measures. You've seen some of their very visible walking and cycling connections as have you had in the city. Um, the notion of parking policies being debated again at the city through the Access Hamilton strategy is also encouraging. So the the um, the practical actions, um, people have a general uh, generally good understanding of what needs to happen, and we're moving there. Um, some new tools uh, that the report said we should probably put in our toolkit, which doesn't really affect on the mandate or function of others. Um, things like aligning our key performance indicators through our strategies and plans, working very closely with the metropolitan spatial plan work at the moment, which you'll we'll touch on again later. Rating and investing in, for regional public transport services and infrastructure. Through annual plan 2022-23, our regional council has consulted on and has agreed now to rate for public transport services for Hauraki, Matamatapiako and Thames Coromandel district councils. That will bring them under this, uh, a very similar model to what is within the city. Um, that still leaves uh, six territorial authorities who rate themselves for public transport services and pass those funds through to the regional council. But we know that Waikato District and Waipa in particular, um, Taupo District as well, have all said that they are keen to do the same. Um, they want to uh, have some more discussions with the regional council about how we make sure that rating model spreads the costs of public transport equitably among communities. And that's work that will be underway soon. Um, increased support for land use planning for improved transport outcomes. So again, um, land use, transport, transport, land use, these things are two sides of the same coin um, and many, uh, less than the city, um, but many other territorial authorities really from a capacity and capability um, perspective struggle with the transport planning side of that coin. Um, and developing new funding tools uh, in particular to enable um, developer contributions and to lead public transport. We all know that when people move home, if they move into a new home, um, the travel habits they form as soon as they move into that place will likely uh, stick with them and be very difficult to shift. So there's a lot of benefit in us seeing what we can do to make sure that there are transport options from day one of new development. At the same time, it's very uh, challenging from a, a commercial perspective to operate a public transport service when you only have 10, 15, 20, 100 even new dwellings um, yet in a development area. Um, developers have increasingly said to us, well, we're happy to forward fund that gap until we've got the numbers um, where you would normally service it. 
um, but we don't currently have the uh, contractual and other tools in our basket to enable us to do that in an efficient way. And just for clarity, I'm not talking about developer contributions, development contributions. That's not a tool that's available to regional councils under current legislation. These are more civil contract type arrangements. Now, lastly, institutional arrangements. Um, so a couple of things here. Um, uh, the top one is really about, you know, if we can start to develop and plan a regional transport, a public transport system as a whole system, can we please fund it as a whole program and a whole system rather than each service being subject to its own individual business case and contestation? Um, and the second is really um, is this. So um, there are a whole range of options for how regional, uh, how public transport and transport services in general may be operated. And you will have actually heard now um, in the, uh, I guess, the future of local government conversations, um, transport is now starting to be discussed within those discussions. And this is really the start of these conversations from the perspective of how do we ensure um, our transport services are able to be planned, funded, um, governed and operated in a highly integrated way across modes. Um, options for changing from how we do things at the moment range from everything um, from co-location of staff um, right through to all singing, all dancing um, uh, transport authorities and at all manner of scales. Um, at the, um, for example, it could cover the future proof area or even a sub area of that, or it could cover the whole region could be responsible for public transport, public transport and infrastructure, um, uh, or subsume the responsibilities of, um, of road controlling authorities. Um, the benefits of more integrated uh, models um, comes when you get into areas where there's competition for road corridor space, um, because you're needing to make those trade-offs between different modes and make an integrated decision across modes where there's less competition for the space on the corridor, then uh, an arrangement that looks more like what we've got now, where you have a public transport authority and a road controlling authority still puts us in reasonably good stead. We know that this is a big journey. Um, uh, this will be a conversation that will be happening through the uh, Future Proof Partnership as well in respect of the Metropolitan Spatial Plan Transport Program, the management case component of that. Um, our consultants did some work for us just to say, what does that decision path look like between where we are now and where we might be? And what are some of the off ramps on that that might exist? What are some of the questions that might be asked? So at the first end, um, you know, is there agreement that there's a need to change? The feedback we've received so far is that yes, there is. As we move further down that spectrum, the, the decisions needing to be taken in terms of changes in roles and responsibilities get more and more significant, right through to entrusting others to make decisions on behalf of um, on behalf of uh, a network that um, that entities might see as theirs. The report um, we went out for targeted consultation. We wrote to um, all of our JMA partners. Uh, we wrote to all territorial authorities and others. Um, seeking feedback. We received quite a lot of feedback um, and I'll, I'll get into the implementation strategy that's resulted from that um, because it was the implementation strategy that was informed from that feedback was approved in April. The next steps, which are really the highlights, um, the key actions from that implementation strategy, which is stepping towards a sub-regional public transport entity. Um, exactly what that entity is, uh, what it covers, will be the subject of this Metro Spatial Plan Transport Program and its management case. Um, but there is a high degree of appetite within those future proof uh, partners to really have a hard look at how we organise ourselves because we know um, not just from a financial perspective, um, but also from a management uh, perspective, we're going to need to do things differently to make sure we have a really tightly aligned and integrated infrastructure and services program. Um, a consistent regional funding model. I've talked a little bit about some of that, but it's really doing what we can to work with territorial authorities in particular to give them comfort um, that they can entrust us with rating for 
regional uh, for public transport services and potentially some forms of public transport infrastructure region wide in an equitable model. Enhanced regional engagement. Some of the feedback we had from outside uh, from the wider region was that um, we're not sure whether we trust, um, in, their, in their words, decisions made in Hamilton to reflect the needs of our rural communities. And that's something that uh, I know um, the Connections Committee Chair, Angela Strange, who's in this meeting as well, um, really, really heard, um, heard very clearly. And uh, we're going to be working hard to revisit some of those arrangements for how we get that local that local voice, that regional local voice, right into the heart of public transport decision making. Um, in particular, if we're going to be entrusted um, with the strings in respect of um, funding. Um, proactive planning, um, one of the consequences of our current funding model, um, which is where territorial authorities outside of Hamilton rate services, is that um, we, we have a, an administration premium on top of those charges for services, and that enables us to, to plan and manage those networks. Now, our current model means that we never have the headroom to do the planning and management of those services um, uh, or to plan for new services outside of the urban area or other areas where there are already substantial services. Um, we know that's not an adequate model. It doesn't enable us to plan for the future. Um, and aligning expectations, and I mentioned a little bit about that. Um, we're also, uh, we've also been asked to, and will through the Regional Public Transport Plan, providing infrastructure guidance. This is really to assist um, under current arrangements, road controlling authorities to provide infrastructure for different types of services that looks and feels pretty similar and consistent wherever you are in the region. There are some big interrelationships here between this and other big pieces of work going on. Um, the Hamilton Waikato Metro Spatial Plan Transport Program, um, we've got to think of a new name for that one, but I've um, already mentioned that, um, in particular in relation to those institutional arrangements for, um, for the uh, what we're terming the metro area. Um, our own regional public transport plan, um, the Regional Connections Committee is in the process of of finalising the draft for consultation. Consultation will be over the month of July. And of course, a national emission reduction plan, which sets some pretty ambitious targets. Um, and uh, the working through of that, um, which really sets, um, uh, sets some high bars in terms of where we need to be going. Uh, a 20% reduction in vehicle kilometres travelled um, nationally, um, kind of that's being apportioned regionally and locally um, at the moment in terms of some modelling work. Um, and the lion's share of that will fall to urban areas because that's where alternative transport options exist. Um, and so, uh, as you can imagine, um, not only public transport, but public transport, micro mobility, walking and cycling, all of these things are going to be um, incredibly important to seeing that those emission reduction um, targets are achieved. And that's the end of my presentation, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mark. Let's open it up for questions. Norman. Uh, kia ora. Um, mō tēnei whakamarama tanga. I sat in a council meeting from 9.30 to 6.30 the other day, uh, and a lot of it, 99.9% of the room, traffic. And I often question myself, what role does EWI have in the context of traffic? And I kind of, in my head, design this little fucker pop a chart. And when you think about traffic, you think about roads. When you think about roads, you think about runoff. When you think about runoff, you think about environmental pollution. When you think about environmental pollution, you think about Totajane Awa Tupuna to protect and to restore um, our river. So these are these are connection there. Um, and so um, there's this there's lots of conversations and I know that um, uh, Dave Mack and others here and, and, and Angela are working collaboratively together there. But I'm wanting to know what role does EWI play in assisting the strategy? And and I thought about it um, and, and I shared some thoughts. And there's an option around the water taxi, right, using the river to, to transport and to help emissions and all those other KPIs. But I think there's a couple of things um, that the EWI can certainly do is, is become part of the bigger and deeper conversation at, at that level. Um, uh, 
I'm going to ask the council, um, how do they lead by example? And when I talk, I'm going to ask the question around your uh, EV fleet and a 100% EV. Um, what role does education play? So, so I think there's a role of education and advancing the knowledge of the next generation um, and helping to grow and sustain that level of behaviour uh, as we move. And and um, uh, how do we support Mahitai, the Waka Kotahi, Hamilton City Council, um, Tautatune, Kuniheirane, um, Mete Iwi. And I think when we talk about Iwi, it's not just the Iwi Authority, it's actually the Hapu as well. Uh, because we, in our uh, wider catchment, we've got our hapu that are doing some good things there, and I know that's where this metro, metro spatial plan comes into play. Um, so I just wanted to, how can iwi help? Um, are those ideas all right? And um, what's the council strategy towards assisting in terms of 100% um, EV fleet? I think you've got to have a bit of putia to buy an EV, uh, EV car. I think mean, you've got to be on the salary of the regional council to be able to afford one, but that's another cut it off. <laughs> Can I just say one last thing? I think there's a name for that long word that you had, and ara tika, ara means pathway, tika means to be correct. So just a for Kauri. So that, kuna taka patai, Anji. Yeah, kia ora, uh, Norm 3, Madam Chair. The, um, a couple of points that you've raised there, um, I think, for me, um, uh, we we talk about transport. Um, I think when we zoom out of this and we talk about, well, when we're talking about public transport, what I think we're really talking about is accessibility, and something that um, something that we are uh, looking to do um, in the not too distant future, actually, quite soon on the back of the regional public transport plan, is to reimagine what our what our five-year implementation plan looks like. We call it our improvement program. And one area that I know hasn't informed our planning to the extent that it probably should have has been matters of, um, and I don't want to focus too much on, on the deprivation side of things, but, um, uh, but you might be familiar with the index of multiple deprivations, um, some work um, done through the University of Auckland um, and transport uh, accessibility is a big component of what drives some of those things, access to education, health, employment, um, civic and social engagement, um, these kinds of things. And that is, uh, I think that's absolutely an area that we are looking to uh, increasingly take partnership approaches to meeting needs where our traditional business model for providing public transport services hasn't. Um, so uh, if I use an example, uh, we are um, uh, we have been having some discussions uh, in Topol, um, which has uh, brought to the table a few a few different people who are interested in providing potentially a public transport services across commercial uh, entities, uh, iwi entities, tertiary uh, tertiary institutes, and um, and they currently have they currently have some rudimentary services operating. There's a possibility of us applying a similar model to a partnership that we've struck just as a effectively a trial to see how it goes with the Waikato DHB, which has been to install our ticketing machines on their services. What that means is those services all of a sudden become available to the general public. The revenue from that ticketing can go back in to fund those services. So there are all sorts of imaginative ways that we could potentially partner um, with a whole range of entities, and in particular iwi entities, to extend the reach of, uh, to improve accessibility regionally. Um, so I think that's 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 one element um, that I think uh, is really important for us to um, be, be open to partnership over. Um, in respect of our fleet and um, the transport emission reduction side of things, um, uh, we are, through the public transport plan, um, setting a pathway for, or quite an ambitious pathway, to have a, um, a, a net zero um, public transport fleet. And by net zero, I mean that in the first instance, um, we'll be looking to make sure we cost in the emissions of the current fleet. And as our contracts renew, ensure that to the extent that we are able, those fleets are zero emission fleets. Um, 
On top of that, um, we may not need to do anything. We will do something, but we may not need to. Um, we're already seeing through a couple of our recent tenders, well, our most recent tender, and this was out for Topol, um, some Topol South Waikato services, that we are, we we think that we are likely to be crossing past crossing pa cost parity between diesel and electric fleet, which means that when we come around to our new contract cycle for our main urban contracts in 2026, um, we are uh, we are forming the view that it is highly likely, whether we specified or not, we are going to get a fully electric fleet, um, providing we can come up with some of the infrastructure for those fleets to charge at. Um, so I'm very optimistic about moving to a zero emission fleet. Um, I guess the other part is, um, uh, uh, in respect of, um, I guess, another area that I'm, I'm really interested in exploring, we've, we've got good uh, striking up uh, increasingly strong partnerships with the University of Waikato um, and hoping to stretch into uh, WinTech. Um, on, a, on a few fronts, um, with those institutes, it's all about um, trying to promote engagement in, uh, in various transport and accessibility type professions as, as a career path. Um, there is only one transport planning qualification in New Zealand, and that's the University of Auckland. Transport planners come from all sorts of places, um, probably a few too many engineers, but a whole bunch of other disciplines uh, we would like to see engaged in transport planning. Um, and the other area, of course, is something that um, that's really high in our minds at the moment, which is our, our I guess, our core workforce in respect of um, in respect of uh, our public transport drivers. Um, where uh, increasingly the paying conditions associated with those roles is being are being improved, um, and uh, as we all know. Um, there is, uh, you know, there's there's a significant shortage in that area at the moment. But we know that the uh, we know that uh, the uh, we know that for many people, for for different reasons, and it may not be a particularly attractive employment proposition. Um, uh, through Madam Chair, I, I think maybe I hit on some of the high points from Norm's quarter door, but I'm happy to. Just up. Um, so just that it's a. Probably stepping back from the report, Mark, but just thinking about Norman's question, um, how can Iwi be assured, or you know, Māori in general within the region, that um, what report do they look to from the space that equity of access has been addressed in terms of our, our and I, I would argue for our rural community, because Huntley's considered that. Um, so how, what report without going through line by line looking for Māori details will be uh, how would that be reported out of the system that equity of access has been addressed in the following ways to rural, disabled, elderly communities, mm. I guess, because those are, as I understand our people, mate, it's the shopping bus, it's the school bus um, and things like that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yes, through you, Madam Chair, there's not currently a single place that you can look for that. And this is one of the challenges, um, I, I think, that, you know, that we will, that we will take and see how we can address it. Because as I said, there are excellent reports that give you a picture of the current state, and then there's about five different places that you would need to look to say what services are available to meet particular needs in a particular location. And then when you boil it right down to an individual at their home wanting to go to do something, they need to either contact a community transport provider, a health shuttle, or our own um, a, a total mobility um, taxi driver. Um, our own, uh, our own apps in terms of uh, journey planning. Um, it is, it is a complicated um, system, not only in respect of giving a picture of what's available in a particular community and how different needs are being met, um, but I think perhaps more importantly, from the perspective of the individual person who needs to go and do something, and might want to do something other than drive their own car. No, it's, it's absolutely um, there and. We are working, um, actually nationally, there's quite a lot of work going on uh, in terms of technology platforms to try and um, uh, try and provide some kind of ability to aggregate different transport options so that people can make decisions between, is it a total mobility thing, 
is it a health shuttle thing is it a community transport thing or a general public transport thing Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh, sure. There you go. Awesome. Oh, my still push buttons. Um, uh, you answered. I had questions about um, the design, future design with zero emissions, which is awesome. Are there um, again, given that we we're trying to include our rural Fano, what services will be provided on those to allow, or I guess entice? People or Fano wanting to use the services because I know, um, and you know, Tamaki, the it can be very long the um, trips and everything. So is that factored into designing? It absolutely is. Um, so uh, it was um, hidden in one of, and it, uh, it'll be hidden somewhere in that report. Um, but we know that one of the things there's a couple of things that really. Um, make people want to use public transport and what the main things are really journey time and frequency and this is why you will see increasingly a move to and um, a move to higher frequency more direct routes what high frequency more direct routes um, means is that the coverage routes that we have and do still provide and will continue to provide uh, that wend their way through back streets and around many corners, we won't be able to provide as many of those in the same way as we do currently. They're very slow, they're very expensive, and not many people get on them. Instead, what you'll see is um, us finding other ways to provide those coverage services to people who might not be with an easy access of a frequency, of a high frequency route, or to get them to those high frequency routes. You'll see, if you wait long enough, you'll see one of our new flex buses going past the window here, taking people out to the airport. Um, that type of smaller vehicle running on a demand responsive basis to a catchment area rather than on a fixed route are increasingly the types of services that we expect that you'll see. We're running a few pilots and trials at the moment. Um, so far, they're seeming to be successful. They have some limitations. But in particular, um, in rural areas, we think they may well be exactly what's needed. Um, uh, time will tell. But as well as that, like I said before, um, those relationships with uh, community and uh, community transport providers and health transport providers are something that we're looking to try and um, be able to serve up, not, not take over or subsume those community and health service providers, but how can we uh, how can we serve that up or help that be served up in a really integrated way um, so that people have access to the kind of service they need to take them where they need to go? Um, but that's probably the main thing really is that we know we know that most of it is about frequency and speed and um, these consolidation of services, the high frequency routes is really uh, where it's at. But um, keeping in mind that that coverage objective to make sure everyone has accessibility finding new ways to serve that need as well. Um, thank you. And I have one more question. So you touched on the potential workforce. Um, what percentage would, can or would be guaranteed will first of all be Māori um, and also in Aotearoa instead of looking elsewhere, overseas, during the whole production? Um, sorry, thank you, Madam Chair. I think the question was what, per, what percentage of Māori? Can you guarantee will be Māori and then not um, within Aotearoa? So, um, you know, I think you also may comment that there's too much um, engineers and et cetera. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just, I think, um, looking at it, we're still going to have a good partnership with iwi or even ensuring that um, mahi stays or is available within Aotearoa only for those, well, for recruitment. I just want to look at how that can be factored into any or all of the decisions if you're going to be looking at recruitment. Um, yeah, through, through you, Madam Chair, I guess at the moment we're still really early in small steps in this. And so for me, um, the, work that, the work that I'm doing is really trying to promote uh, transport, uh, people getting involved in transport as a profession. 
Um, and to that extent, as opportunities arise, they do sometimes, we're a relatively small team, but if we have a vacancy, for example, at the right level, we'll be, we do look to tertiary institutions to say, um, who are your best grads for the year that we might be able to bring in and work with us? Uh, equally, um, we would be uh, we would be very very warmly welcoming of people that um, came through other channels into those kinds of opportunities. And if that included through iwi partnership channels, then that would be all to the good. Um, uh, like I said, um, uh, but I, I guess I, I guess I have to stop short of any kind of um, at the moment of, of you know being able to commit to any particular percentages. Um, we do have uh, we do have staff who are Maori. Um, of course we do, um, but I couldn't put my finger on the exact percentage, and I'm not sure, I can't answer the question about the wider driver workforce. So, um, uh, just for clarification, um, the driver workforce on the operator side, that's all managed um, under a national model, the public transport operating model, that sees us contract out under with quite, quite tight kind of edges around the model. Um, out to operators, and they are employed by um, and the driver workforce are employed by our operators, uh, and the Waikato, the majority of our operations are go bus. Thank you, Donald. I think you had some more questions. Yeah, um, kia ora, mate. Um, a lot of mahi going in there. Um, I suppose the, the first part of the question would be um, around the funding. And the strategy of the other entities to Waka Kotahi. How far is that along? Um, yeah, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I would have to say, uh, really in its infancy. So, um, as well as Waka Kotahi, though, uh, there is another source of direct Crown funding um, that is a possibility, particularly for things like the metro area under the Metropolitan Spatial Plan Transport Program. That's what we've seen come to bear in places like Auckland with the Auckland Transport Alignment Program, ATAP, and with getting Wellington moving. Um, those have also those have had considerable crown uh, contrib direct crown contributions. In the other areas, um, we we the f the partnership funding has been indirect. Um, so it might be in the form, for example, of funding a specific concession for a group of people. So with uh, the University of Waikato, for example, um, they're using the, the parking charges that they have on site there at their main campus um, to fund an additional concession for their students, which knocks another 50% off the fair price, which at the moment means that they're getting around for about 50 cents a journey. Um, the Waikato DHB are, are also contributing funding in a similar way to provide a concession, different model. Anyone coming to, or it will be, anyone going to or from uh, the Hamilton Hospital campus um, will have a 50% uh, journey. So they are making financial contributions, um, but they are contributing in a way that targets a particular user group by way of concessions. Um, we, like I said, we have other, um, there aren't, however, other opportunities for people to make direct contributions into the system in order to fund particular services. Um, in a way, um, anything's possible. Um, and one of the good examples then, uh, again, I think I'd have to give is, is with the Waikato DHB, the one I gave previously, where, in fact, they're the ones that have uh, contracted the service, we're helping them pay for that a bit through public affairs, which means we also don't have to duplicate with another public service. That's, that's awesome. And I, I'm, I'm sort of looking to the strategy, um, so the longevity and the successful mm. approach is is, um, is connected. So just with, with, with the other hat, it's just that working in a collaborative, like as an iwi, working together for the same goal would probably be really good and that's what Norman's talking about and asking the question about you know we, how can we play a part um, so dropping down to, to another question in the collaboration and design space um, with growth with growth sales happening in lots of different parts of the regional council area um, what what does that actually look like? You know, I hear the voices of the 
our whanos in the different rural spaces. Um, and the example that I'd give is where bus stops are placed or access to transport. And the strategy moving forward um, in, a, in a different way of thinking, like um, there's a lot more uh, cultural symbolism, areas that have been identified in different spaces. So is there a synergy um, around that kind of a thinking so that the access to transport is not just speed and frequency, but can also be a enjoyable educative role. So we actually we're focusing on an, another target population um, and asking that question. Um, so where where would that sit and how would that engagement look to to say Hapu Marai or Waikato Tainu that want to participate, like Norm was saying, because they have got very good um, corridor that could actually help in a strategy as such if, if that were available to them. Yeah. Um, through you, Madam Chair, I would say um, there's a couple of, there's a few really good opportunities, but it, it comes back to, I guess, integrated planning, um, really. And so, and there's a few opportunities for that. And it, in a completely greenfields location, um, uh, there's um, in a completely greenfields location. There's plenty of opportunity to make sure that the locations of things like um, it, you know uh, bus stops and bus routes, and things like that, are, are put in places and uh, are put in places that are both operationally efficient, but also serve other community needs. Um, but in respect of um, in respect of the existing network, uh, where bus stops are placed, where they might be moved to, what they look like, what the opportunities are to provide um, other experiences uh, when you're there, um, you know, provide information about the, lo the locality, these kinds of things. This is one of the. This is something that is is quite challenging, um, and um, of course there is an opportunity to be engaged uh, earlier. In network planning, when we are undertaking changes to bus routes and those types of things, um, and so uh, I guess that's um, that's something that we can you know we can make sure we do. We have um, we do have obligations um, to consult, um, but we know that there's uh, there's always more that we can do in that space. Um, but one of the system challenges we have here is the split in responsibilities between different parts of the system, between different entities. And in spite of our best efforts, and I, I genuinely mean that in spite of our best efforts across districts and regional councils, um, these things often don't line up. Um, so the, pub, the bus stops, um, their specification, occasionally their precise locations are determined by territorial authorities, and we provide the bus services. Um, now, um, like I say, in spite of our best efforts, because you can imagine when it comes to the budget time, uh, preparation of long term plans, big processes, um, really hard limits that are being uh, that are having to be worked up against um, the timing of whether or not a bus stop renewal program is going to happen in year one or year two might be a decision that a territorial authority will make. Um, and often have to make very quickly at the heat of the moment. And we're doing a very similar thing in terms of the phasing and staging of our public transport investments. And so this is one of those one of those things at I guess at a at a very detailed level, but actually a very good example of one of the challenges with the split in responsibilities between infrastructure and operation provision in respect to public transport. And I guess one of the reasons why I'm really keen to make sure even some of those low-level infrastructure things, it might not be busways, it might not be, you know, big, big things, but small things like the placement of bus stops and the provision of those, doing those within a single model at least, I think would give us some significant benefits, including give us a real opportunity to take those opportunities that you've just talked, spoken to. Just a follow-on through the chair. Um, so, so at governance level, Yeah, so at, at governance level, so I know that there is a, a collaborative committee like Te Huia that goes across, even goes into Auckland. Um, and then I know that there's wastewater um, where a lot of the different municipalities uh, are working together. Um, how could we achieve this in this space? Um, because there is a, a common, a common thread of working together, and I suppose that's my best, my my question is 
how can we line these up? Who do we need to talk with um, to actually achieve this common goal? Mm. Um, through the chair, we have, um, as, as you'll be aware, we do have a regional connections committee currently. Um, and I think what I'm hearing is a very similar sentiment um, or, or a possibility to bring two little opportunities together in respect, you know, in respect of how we are engaging uh, with rural areas in respect of public transport decision making. Um, and I think there's probably an opportunity to open that corridor a little bit wider um, than focusing on territorial authorities or our council um, to uh, you know, to give our our council um, the ability to consider um, how the uh, you know how iwi might feature in that um, in that governance as well. Uh, Jean, thank you. Um, so I suppose I'll try and keep it brief. Just to give some background, I've, I'm a huge fan of this work. Um, I think it's absolutely critical for helping bring emission reductions about in transport. Uh, as, as beautiful as walking and cycling is, there are rainy days and people need to get around. Um, I've been very lucky to be a part of um, the public, regional public transport plan um, workshops. And uh, just as some background, I'd put forward quite a bit around um, having a belief that mobility is, is a public, is a service that people have a right to have um, and that the cost of living um, can very effectively be addressed if we get our public transport right. Um, so one of the goals that I've um, put forward there that seemed to be well accepted was that um, at the very least in an urban setting like Hamilton that um, the goal would be not to have to own a car, since that is a huge cost on, on a lot of people, uh, myself included. And I've also been pushing quite a bit to make sure that we're really thinking big on what public transport is, rather than just what it always was, um, and thinking creatively. And um, as I mentioned, uh, Tipper inspired me to just mention this, that um, I'm really keen to see us, even at the Regional Council, move towards thinking of the lived experience of the individual to what that looks like. So whether that be this technology that you mentioned, Mark, or whether that be the way that we change, that we put out our education and information for a community um, or a suburb or anything like that. Um, because it came apparent to me in the annual plan um, hearings recently of trying to decide, do we put services somewhere or not? For me, that is very much answered when I can see the big picture of what all the various things are, the commercial services that are out there, the community services and the um, regional council services on top of that. So I think if we can give people that information, uh, we will get good information back as to what makes their lived experience a really good one. Um, just so that you know where that's coming from. Thanks. Uh, Pamela. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mark. Um, as always, a very informative um, and thorough report and, and presentation. So thank you for that. Just a, a f I'll start with a couple of comments. I think it's fantastic how you're working with the tertiary uh, education providers in this region. Uh, I think that that's a real uh, important mechanism for regional council as a whole to communicate what are the, the upcoming needs of, of the workforce to, to serve the responsibilities of this organization going forward. So thanks for, for having those conversations and encouraging us to do so. Um, you mentioned with the, uh, the rating change proposal, you talked about that being about spreading the cost equitably amongst communities. And I suppose picking up some on the conversations here today about rural communities. How do we navigate that um, uh, the cost being distributed equitably amongst communities versus the ability of community members to equitably access the, um, the public transport? Because as we've talked about, there's no, there's no bus coming to where I live in any, 
any short space of time. Um, yes, through through the chair. Um, there are there are there are infinite options to how we could imagine an equitable funding or well, a funding system, and our goal is to make it as equitable as possible. Um, currently, the funding model, um, and, and this is um, not just in the Waikato, and there's no reason why we need to stick to it, um, but for there'll be some, um, we don't want to get too complicated on ourselves, but the way that we operate it at the moment is that we have uh, explicitly say that there are direct beneficiaries, those people who have services that they can access directly, um, they're in the catchment for that service or, or, or what have you, or indirect beneficiaries. So. Um, everybody benefits from having public transport around because it means that there's less people on the road, communities benefit, um, these kinds of things. And there's a share um, at the moment, it's, um, we, we work on roughly 80-20. 80% um, 80 is paid for by direct beneficiaries and 20% provided by, um, by the, the, whole, um, the whole of the region or the whole of that community. That's a, that's our, that's a rough model. Um, and it's what's been applied as an interim step in Hauraki, Matamata Piako, and Thames Coromandel as well, in respect of those urban areas through which services go, um, attract both the direct and indirect beneficiary rate, and in other areas, the indirect. But there are many ways that we could cut that model, um, and probably things we haven't even thought about. Thanks. Um, just a couple more questions, if I can. Um, I, I hear the... the um, rationale for for more uh, integrated planning and and I can absolutely see where the disconnects of the responsibilities have led to to some inefficiencies. Um, I think that an important aspect in in any movement in that direction though is ensuring that there is still that local voice um, uh, because I uh, while I represent um, the Waikato constituency, I couldn't tell you the best place to put a bus stop in Tuakal. Uh, and so let's make sure that, that there is still ability for those who are living in those communities. As Jen was saying, you know, the, those who are living, the, the experience can provide uh, input into that. You mentioned uh, about developers, uh, you know, as developments go in, we don't have enough houses to, to um, justify a full service, but developers funding, forward funding uh, PT until there, there are sufficient numbers for us. What is the appetite for that? How many developers have been open to that? Uh, is it just one or two, or is there a general acceptance that that's something that developers need to consider and participate in? Mm. Um, yeah, through the chair, um, I've now had at least three conversations with major developers who are looking to do this, either either provide their own service as a bridge or looking to the regional council to fund um, or funding the regional council to provide services. Um, there's a couple, there's one a significant one up the Waikato Expressway. Mm -hmm. um, there's also at Takofa to under Kainga Orders support. Um, and there are also a couple of developers on the edge of the city um, so there is an increasing understanding of the need to make sure that people have multiple options in new developments. I think um, if we can start to make, uh, if we can make that as easy as possible, um, uh, yeah, there is there is there is significant potential benefit there. I'm not exactly sure what yeah. the size is, but yeah. um, we have been approached. Yeah, I I think that we should continue to have those conversations strongly when we are approached by, by developers. Um, and last question, uh, what's been the impact of the half price fares on patronage for public transport? Um, yeah, through the chair, um, it has been very difficult to tell. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our our call take at the moment of pulling some analytics together nationally. Um, you can imagine um, the half price fares came in just around the same time as school holidays were happening um, and a whole bunch of other changes in networks around the country. We we think that we might have had between a 7 and 10% increase in public transport patronage. That could be attributed to that. Um, in saying that, we're still operating at about 60% of the patronage as we were prior to COVID. So it's, uh, like I said, it's difficult to tell. Current estimates are between 7 and 10%. Thank you. 
Kia ora, Pamela. I think Angela has got her hand up online. Kia ora, Angela. Kia ora. Thank you um, for the opportunity to comment and ask a question. Um, yeah, thanks, Mark, for your presentation. Um, yeah, fantastic. Um, I just had a really quick question um, around the potential for future partnerships with Te Wananga. Um, I know that we've worked really hard to get the partnership, as you say, with um, DHB, uh, University of Waikato and Wintec. Um So, yeah, just wondering where we're at with that or... Um, yeah, where that might be leading in the future. Um, yeah, through the chair, um, the uh, I know we had had some preliminary discussions with Te Wananga. Um, I don't think that they have progressed much further yet, but they are. Um, uh, but we know that they may well be interested in establishing a similar concession type arrangement as with um, the University of Waikato and the DHB. Um, so, um, you know, we've, we've got the model there now for them to be able to plug into quite easily. Um, and so we'll, we'll be continuing those conversations with them. Thank you. Well, kia, kia ora, Mark. I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first question is, what role does the Metro um, program transport business case, Hiaratika, um, as coined by Norm, have in setting direction that would be implemented through the work that you're doing? Um, yes. Uh, the, um, when you see the network plan and the regional public transport plan and the network plan through the Metropolitan Spatial Plan, you will see a remarkable degree of similarity between the two in terms of the long-term aspirations for the urban area PT network. Um, so uh, they they are highly aligned. In fact, the in terms of the management and financial case, it's been worked on as well for the Metro Spatial Plan. We're helping to cost that. Um, the costs will look in respect to the zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 30 type timeframes um, will be aligned as well. So really, um, what the Metro Spatial Plan Transport Program does is uh, it's done a lot of the work to confirm what that what that long term network should look like. And what we're really doing is um, uh, through this work is how do we make it uh, how do we make it come about within the urban area? Um, so uh, there's a um, uh, one way to think about it is um, the Metro Spatial Plan provides us with the 30 year where we're going, asks some really hard questions about how we're going to organise organize ourselves to deliver it. Um, and the work that um, I'm doing with my directorate at the moment and with the wider region in respect of public transport services is how fast can we push that within our current operating model while working on improving the operating model so we can create the vision painted through the Metro Spatial Plan for the urban area. So they're, um, they're effectively the same thing. And I do know that um, for the Metro Spatial Program business case, we've got a staff member from Waikato Tainui sort of involved in the details of that, Julian, and Shane Solomon is also involved. For those who don't know, um, there are some representatives, I suppose, involved in that level. When it comes to informing um, what you're doing, what do you think the best way of our people at a local level, because it's it's not around this table, um, to be honest, what do you think the best way of getting providing the voice for our people to participate in prioritising the needs of, say, Rahui Pōkeka as an example, um, in, in the work that you're doing and driving forward into the implementation plan and, I guess, prioritisation of funding? Yeah, look, I think it's I think it is through the uh, the network planning and design elements. Um, that's really when um, that's really when it hits hits the ground when uh, when we go into a community and say, look, we would like um, you know we've uh, um, we're in the process of updating or reviewing the network in this area. What is it that you'd like to see come out of that review? Um, what are your what are your needs? Now, again, I'd say this is something that we're um, we are just starting to step into outside of the Hamilton area because it's not an area that we've had the headroom 
under our current funding model to do that proactive engagement and planning to the extent that we would like to have, we've had to effectively wait until we're invited in by the territorial authority who said that we would like to fund these services, can you help us deliver them? Because you're the public transport authority, not us. Um, hopefully by moving to that more proactive footing, we'll also be able to get more proactive in our engagement. Um, and through that more proactive engagement, do some more creative thinking about what networks and what other types of transport services might serve any particular community. And I think it's at that level when you're having conversations about what are the needs of this community, um, uh, that you know that the real uh, the real value gets added in respect of the transport uh, public transport planning. So just going back to our Rahui Pokeka example, so you would maybe expect to engage with Wahi Fanui and maybe some of the marae. Is that how you would approach it? Um, yeah, as I said, that's how we would like to approach it. Um, yeah, the way that we've been, um, uh, the way that uh, we have done it is we've effectively supported territorial authority engagement. Um, mm -hmm. And that looks different depending on which TA and which part of the region. Rahu um, Pukka for Waikato District Council. I know they have said um, they have asked us to come work with them on um, on updated network planning, in particular for North Waikato. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what uh, the engagement plan for that looks like at the moment. So I guess maybe just as an action, I think it would be um, useful to for us to know that that level of engagement is happening. And if there are any barriers at a TLA level, because it's a bit hoha for us, because we have to talk to district council and you guys separately and Wakakotahi um, for us to be informed so that we can push those buttons as well. So we've got members on, on our side, Donald, who sits on the Waikato District Council, JMA, and uh, Norman and Jocelyn, who are heavily involved in, again, just picking on Rahui Pokika in that community. So it would be great to, I guess, have that recorded as something to follow up on and, you know, in the near future so it doesn't just um, get left as a good idea. Yeah, no problem for you, Madam Chair. So I'll take I'll take that away in particular in light of the network planning activity that's just starting to happen in the Waikato district. Yeah. Um, we can zoom in on that particular one to make sure we get your response. And my, my other question or comment was um, heavily related to, to the previous one um, and what we've just discussed, and that's around uh, Donald's point on standardisation and really delivering better outcomes with the infrastructure that is installed. So, you know, better bus stops, bus stops that, you know, tell a story that are more interactive, that do something more than, you know, provide a, a little bit of shelter from the rain. Um, if there's a way of bringing that into the, the conversation as well. Um, yes, absolutely. I'll, I will follow up on on that. Um, uh, I, I hope that that is part way addressed um, uh, over time by the regional council through the public transport plan, providing guidance at least in terms of what the physical thing should be specified to do in respect of uh, shelter. Um, the heights of curbs to enable people to access level entry on the low floor buses and these kinds of things. I think that'll be an important first step. It's not something that we've done to date, um, but I think that will be an important first step. And then we can add layers on top of that as we as we go and get the first steps. Um, we can follow them with the second and third. Sure, to Mark. And I, I did just want to commend the innovation of working with other providers, um, district health or health service providers, and I guess providing opportunities for our people in the you know, in the regions to be able to more easily access some of those core services. So, kia ora, Mark. There are no other questions or comments, Mr. Kochi. Thank you. Um, I think this has been a really uh, it's a key part of what I wanted to see engagement, more engagement on this matter because the well-being of communities is driven through public transport uh, and the comments by fellow councillors really enforce that. So thank you, Mark, and thank you to the, your team behind you. Happy to see you. Thank you. All in favour? Aye. Aye. So Tip is just um, departing.
And James has uh, um, suggested that we take a couple of minutes to stretch the legs, go to the toilet, get a water. So we'll come back at um, five minutes to 12, 11.55.
how do I um how do I I'm sharing I've got to share the screen. Mm -hmm. Um um so if I share it, we do you pick, the, one, you pick the screen you want to oh, fuck yeah, that's right. Sorry. Yeah, pick the green Done. You Have another practice, Manaki. Oh, turn it off. Just while they're not there, have another little practice with the sound. Can you hear that? No. Oh, God. <coughs> I've got computer sound here. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. maybe um, unmute, unmute your mic and also turn up the sound on your computer as well. Yep, I've got the. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, yep, I'll try again. There's usually a little button you tick A to say share sound. Yeah, include computer sound, right? That's, that's what I'm pushing. Okay. Yep, that's the yep. one. Should be. Still can't. Okay. It's not being shared on um our side. You're not yes. sharing your screen. Mm. Oh. Should be an arrow top right hand corner of the screen. There should be an arrow on the top right hand corner of the screen. Yeah, yep, yep, got the shared one, and then I push share, and then I use the include computer sound. Yep. Are you picking which window are you picking? Which window? Oh, there we go. But can you hear the sound? That's what I want to know. Yep. Yes. yep, we can hear the sound. Yep, that yes. was clear. Apply, apply, Mano. Thank you, thank you. Nice. Well, kia ora everyone. Let's carry on. I'll stop sharing. So like, like I said earlier, our chair, the chair of Te Aratauta sends his apologies. Um, so in his place, ably um, replaced uh, Manaki and Mara, who have a presentation that they're going to share with us. Over to you, Manaki. Uh, kia ora tātou. I'll just hand it over to um, our CEO to open us up. Kia ora tātou. <coughs> kia ora tātou. Um, I, reflecting on the introductory comments to the hui this morning, um, I feel maybe this would have been more effective and impactful if we went straight after that wonderful introduction from our uh, co-chair and uh, the comments made engari. Um, we are nothing if not flexible, so um, we would like to thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation. Apologies for our chair who's unable to be with um, us today. Um, the purpose of this is to provide some background and, and context to who we are as a niwi, how our journey to sitting with you today in this, in this important tui, um, and just to then bring you up to date with the with the things that our iwi are working uh, on with our partners, including yourselves, um, in 2022. So with that very short introduction and acknowledging that <clears throat> there are people in the room uh, who have just recently left, and I particularly want to acknowledge Tipa, who um, ha have been part of this journey, Don, at Norm and others, uh, they were there at the start and they're still here now doing the mahi, Jackie herself, so ngā mahi mahana kia kaita katoa. Um, to start off, uh, Manaki's going to play us a, a short video. Kia ora tato. Thank you. 
We are defined by our land, our river, our history, and the Kingi Tanga. We are a proud people, each of us descended from the intrepid voyagers who crossed the ocean to land the Tainui Waka on the shores of Kafia in the 13th century. Led by Hoturoa, these tūpuna left Rangiatea to discover a new land. Rich in fertile soils, abundant wildlife, bordered by a plentiful supply of kaimoana. When King Itafiao fled the King Country after the land wars of 1863-64, he provided his people with an enduring message. Mākua no e hanga i tōku nei whare, ko ngā pau oroto he mahoe, te pātete, ko te tā huhu he hina, me whakatuku ki te hua o te ringaringa, me whakapakari ki te hua o te kawariki. Since our Opatu settlement more than 23 years ago, we have focused on building a platform that is stable and solid to realise the aspirations set out in Whakatupuranga 2050 and enlivening the words of King Itafiao. In the ever-changing global environment, our world, our future generations live in, will be significantly different to ours. So, our approach for moving forward is one that embraces change and focuses on developing our people. We have navigated through the highs and lows of modern tribal life and are now valued at over $1.3 billion. Our registered tribal members have grown from 20,000 in 1995 to over 74,000 today. We now have a unique opportunity to reposition ourselves so that we are fit for the future as we move into the next phase together. To realise the aspiration laid out in Whakatupuranga 2050, we must build on the work already completed and continue to make a positive difference in the lives of our tribal members. Mehe mea kare kauana he whakakitenga ka mate te iwi. Te whakakitenga o Waikato members attended three workshops during the year and provided great guidance on where we should focus in the next five years. What we heard was that we need good information and data to support decision making and that we must also work collectively to leverage activities to increase our impact. We must also build skills in our people so our whānau and marae can work towards achieving their own mana motuhake. There are some great opportunities ahead and we are excited about what the future holds for our tamariki and mokopuna. It will require the best of ourselves to create a better future for this and the next generation of Waikato Tainui. Kia tupu, kia hua, kia puawai, to grow, prosper and sustain. Well, kia ora tātou. Um, well, um, so that, that video, as I said, was really just an introduction, and I guess it speaks to um, co-chair Barry's kōrero earlier this morning around uh, where we are as a people and, and where we are aspiring to go. But I guess before we go down that pathway, one of the things that I think it's important for us to share with the council is our, our, our context as an iwi prior to... Um, the most turbulent times in um, New Zealand's history around Raupatu. As a people, Waikato, and, and to be fair, many Māori, we're very entrepreneurial. Um, during our time for Waikato, uh, we had our own flax flour mills, uh, we had our own trading vessels, we had our own iwi bank and our currency, um, and we had our own... Uh, uh, newspaper, uh, which you'll see in the imagery is Te Hoki Oi. Um, we had our obviously our own real tikanga, our identity and our connection to our land and our um, why. So those, those times were very much a time of, as, as referred to in the presentation, the golden years. Um, I guess the irony of all of this is this, this the way we lived back then is very much the focus that we are trying to achieve around a circular economy and our ability to sustain ourselves. So 
during those golden years as a people, Waikato were very entrepreneurial and we did um, a lot. And obviously, as I say, we did a, a bit of trading. Our state highway was the river. Um, and so we did a lot of trading with um, the colonial troops in Tamaki at the time um, to, to, again, enable us to prosper. And again, very our, our, our ancestors, our tūpuna of that time were very, um, very clever people and, and they worked out rather quickly how these uh, new immigrants to this country operated and we were, as I said, we were able to establish our own economy. As we move on, I think one of the things to identify is that Waikato as a region was a very prosperous, uh, pros you had a lot of prosperity. Um, in the map here, you'll see the red outline. Um, that, that basically is the Raupatu boundary, so during the confiscation. So in 1858, um, the Kingitanga was, was established to unite Māori and Hain, uh, to halt the land sales. Um, we had the anointment of the first Māori king, uh, Pototau Te Whero Whero, uh, in Pukawa uh, in Lake Taupo. So our connections with our Tūwhare Tō whānau are very strong, not just from an um, uh, iwi entity as, as Māori, um, but in terms of the ariki and the tohunga that um, were um, identified at that time. Um, as I said, the map in 1863, um, the land wars, uh, Tafio had declared that this would be the Aukati line. So in Mere Mere Musa, he, he made the call that, um, and if there was a breach of that line, um, then that would be considered an act of war. And as you all know, um, the history says that's exactly what happened. So for Tafio, it was one of the most turbulent times. Uh, it was the invasion of the Waikato and the 1.2 million acres of confiscation. And during that time, obviously, for King Tafio, the second Māori king, he was exiled to the king country. And um, hence why uh, Manyoputo has the title of the king country as our whanaunga took him in uh, to protect him during these times. Just in terms of the, again, I think it's important to note, and I think uh, that two weeks ago, um, uh, Marco Ariki uh, and, her, and uh, the attended, went over to the UK uh, to recognise the efforts that were done by the forefathers. Um, we had a search for redress in 1865. In 1884, we had Tafio lead a party to England to petition Queen Victoria he wanted a Māori parliament, an independent commission of inquiry into the land confiscation. Uh, his petition was referred back to the New Zealand government, which, di which dismissed it. And I guess, um, and his sons that followed and his grandsons that followed similarly were there to, um, I guess, attempt to right the wrongs uh, that had occurred during these turbulent times. Um, we had Mahuta come into, uh, into his own and obviously petition Parliament and Tirata, his son, went through to England for the same purposes of his grandfather, uh, King Tafio, to seek an audience with Queen Victoria or at the time. Um, additional leaders that have come into their own during this time also was Te Puya Hirangi, a very prominent woman. Uh, for Waikato, but a very prominent Māori woman, full stop, in terms of what she did uh, for Waikato during the epidemic, the influenza epidemic, but also what she did for Māori women uh, in this country. Um, another scholar, uh, Peite Hiranui Jones, um, again, great leadership in terms of how do we ensure um, protection of our rights as uh, tangata whenua to this land, and how do we protect those? Um, during that time, they also was probably the beginning of Waikato Tainui as an entity through the establishment of the establishment of the Māori uh, Tony Māori Trust Board. And obviously, as uh, Kochi Berry had talked about, um, the uh, uh, arrival of Dane Tarikinui Te Tairangi Kahu, 
and uh, Sir Robert Mahuta, very instrumental in the future of Waikato Tainui. So just uh, quickly to give the historical context in terms of um, our history. So in 87, a claim was filed, our Y30 claim uh, to Parliament, which we are still working through. And then in 1989, it was the Coal Corp case. And that was around ceasing sale of assets of all um, the Coal Corp assets. Further to that, in 92, 94, we had the return of Hopu Hopu, uh, and Tirapa, which now has the base on them. I think the, the point to make about the 92-94 uh, return of those uh, lands, at the time that that was decided by our leadership, uh, including Sir Robert Mahuta, um, it wasn't about the land itself. It wasn't about the, having the return of the land. It was about removing an institution because they were both the army base and the old Air Force Base. It was removing an institution that stood for a time that we were um, completely decimated as a people. So the return of those two lands was about removing any evidence or any uh, memory of what these institutions stood for. And then we go into the 95 um, land, Raupatu land settlement, and I think uh, on the video, it's a bit out of dated, but yeah, I think we're 27 years or, or so in, into our Raupatu settlement. Again, I think the big thing to understand, it wasn't it wasn't about the land as such. It was actually an apology by the Crown that held more um, mana than the actual um, return of the land or the cash assets that returned. Um, so for our old people, and in that photo you can see in front of you with Tiariki Nui, and all those komatua at the back, that was a very emotional time for our people in terms of that apology. So that was the most paramount point of the 95 settlement, was the apology. I think one of the things to also understand is that, um, and we're very fortunate for Waikato, and, and as uh, Mara said, acknowledging people in the room that were part of this, uh, and namely Councillor Mahuta uh, through her, her father around the 95 Raupatu settlement, they experienced a lot of abuse uh, from, from a, a, a array of people, not, not just our own people, from other iwi because of the fact that we were one of the first, uh, we were the first iwi along with Ngai Tahu to undertake an actual settlement. That being said, I think one of the things to um, for us to recognise, and again, these legacy leaders such as Sir Robert, is in our settlement, we have a relativity clause. Uh, and we, along with Ngai Tahu, are the only iwi that have this clause. I think it's fair to say that no government going forward uh, will ever enable a relativity clause of that nature ever again. So again, I think that's a that's a testament to our leadership around their future proofing and their foresight for our people. So while the settlement was 117 million, um, again we recognise that uh, through our relativity clause, uh, we uh, have the opportunity to ensure that we are not disadvantaged as settlements progress uh, over the years to come. Um, so we have our outstanding claims and then we had the Waikato River uh, of which our JMAs and our co-governance structures come out of. So fast forward, um, as I said, we have the 95 and then we have the 2008 Raupatu River settlement. And similar uh, to uh, her husband, um, Lady Raiha, and Tuku Roirangi Morgan, it was more than just the settlement. It was about recognition of an ancestor. So giving rights and protection to our tupuna awa and everything that is attached to her, the tributaries, the land, was, was a big part of that Raupatu settlement. So for those, for the council, you, you'll be familiar that under the JMA, uh, and under the, the, the uh, river settlement, we have um, some key policies 
and one of them being um, Te Mana o Te Awa through Te Ture Whaimana. Um, we have the establishment of the Waikato River Authority. Um, again, Mana Whakahaere, we have our accords, our JMAs. And, and again, I think Lady Raiha, uh, at the time of that settlement for her, she was very clear in her in her her desires to ensure that we could clean up and protect the river. If we are to sustain ourselves as a people, not just as Waikato, but as a people of this country, then we need to ensure that we are protecting and sustaining uh, these, well, again, assets to some, but for us, Tonga, how do we protect and, and ensure the um, the longevity of this, this ancestor of ours? So, Again, the, the river settlement was one of its first of its kind. So within the context of the conversations that are out uh, currently around co-governance, uh, within the context of Three Waters and the RMA, this is not new for Waikato. This whole approach is not a new approach. And I think for Waikato Regional Council, this is not new for you either, to recognise that this mechanism is in place for a reason. And so for us as Waikato, we need to ensure that we continue to build on the co-governance, co-management, and actually make it, um, you know, it, it, it continue to improve on it and, and grow it as, as we go through. One of the things I also just want to mention is that um, with these reforms and the establishments of Te Mano o Te Wai, we can't forget that the genesis of Te Mano o Te Wai actually comes out of Te Mano o Te Awa. But for us as Waikato, Te Mano Te Awa probably is a stronger, has a stronger pulling power than, than the Te Mano Te Wai. So for us, when we're looking at these conversations with the councils, all of our JML councils, we are looking at the highest possible avenue to protect our river, and that will be through the likes of Te Mano Te Awa. Just quickly, as I talk to it, I'll just pull this up. Um, these are obviously the key mechanisms that sit within uh, our settlement. Um, and it is, as I said, Mano Te Awa. We have the River Authority and the function that that plays through the settlement as a clean-up trust. We have Te Ture Whai Mana, which is a critical part of any regional policy statements. And so we want to understand and ensure that that's protected going forward with the new reforms that are in play, whether it's the RMA, whether it's Three Waters, whether it's local government. Uh, we have our, our own environmental plan, Taitumu Taipari Taiao. Also within Waikato, we have our own disposition clause. Um, as far as I understand, we are the only iwi that have that, which in essence is if we do believe there is a breach on a number of matters relevant to our settlement, particularly the river settlement, we have the ability to um, enact disposition and seek legal address from the government of the day. We have, as I said, our, we have a number of accords. We have our co-management fund. We have accords with the Crown, customary activities, cultural harvesting. But all of those, again, they all lead to what we want to achieve around mana whakahaere co-management across um, the region for Waikato. So on that note, I'm going to now uh, hand it over to um, our CEO to continue with the presentation. Kia ora tātou. I think um, when we rush through the story, it doesn't really give you the essence of what our people have actually gone through. So um, the hurt, the loss, um, yeah, it's really hard to, to convey that to you. And I've watched, you know, it's great to have a video, but to sit with like Tipa and learn from her. You got you guys at the regional council have an amazing opportunity with someone like Tipa as part of your uh, as part of your council. Um, yeah, it, it, that was that was a story told too quickly in my opinion. But hey, we are looking to work together to provide induction for your staff and your councillors, and hopefully. Uh, in that, we can um, give you a little bit more of the of the wairua that comes with that story. But my job today is to talk to you about where we are today as a iwi. We've come through over 100 and, 150 years of, of pain and suffering and confiscation 
to come now to what they call us as a $1.4 billion tribe. And we are very proud of that. We're a marae based structure, 33 hapu, 68 marae. And in the video, it said 74,000. We are now 80,000 plus tribal members and two thirds of our population are under the age of 40. And you can see some of those fine specimens on that photo, on that photo there. Thank you, Manaki. This shows you the spread of our marae, very much in the Waikato Regional Count, uh, Council's uh, area of um, responsibility. And so Tūranga Waiwai at the heart, um, you know, Norman reckons his is at the heart, but I say Tūranga Waiwai at the heart <laughs> um, is the biggest marae in terms of membership. So we're nearly 4,000 tribal members. So on my son, on my side, my son has a connection there. And then he has a connection right out on the coast to Pukirewa, which has about 270 members. So there's a huge spread. Uh, we go right up into Tamaki, and as you can see, right down into the King Country. 68 marae, 33 hapu, 80,000. This is the picture of our tribal structure. Now you guys can probably hear us say Te Whakakitenga and Te Aratauta. So this is the picture that shows you what we're talking about. Our marae uh, sit at the top. Um, in, in our tribal parliament, we have two representatives from each of those marae. We come together quarterly to talk, to make decisions, uh, to wānanga. So that's Whakakitinga. From there, our executive uh, membership, of which Jackie, Don, uh, Don are members. Tuku's our chair, of course. Uh, management of day-to-day -day operations and um, the directors of our organisation. Um, sitting on the side there, you'll see our college, Tainui College for Research and Development, the brains of the organisation. And on the other side, you'll see in the black box, the commercial arm, whose job it is to generate the income, provide a distribution to, to ourselves as the, as the Lands Trust and the River Trust, and disperse that distribution out to our marae and our tribal members. So we'll share this uh, organisational chart for you because we know that people can get it, get confused. Now, Whakatupurana 2050 is our uh, strategic document. It sets out our plan for all our people, every, 80, every one of the 80,000 of them. By 2050, we want to be able to say that uh, as a people, we are committed to kingitanga as the unification and the uniting body of Waikato. I'm fluent in my te reo Māori. I'm strong in my tikanga. I'm healthy, well educated, financially the strict, secure, environmentally conscious, and socially sound. So we're trying to build a tribe of super people, obviously. And um, so, if you were to take a test and tick, tick each one off, where are you? And that's a test for you. I think about uh, Te Whare Kura o Rako Manga, who are trying to build a community of ideal Waikato students. And this is this is some of the this is the the uh, vision that they have for their students as well. And in that picture to the to the left, is it or my my right? Um, it took that sort of a, a visual depiction of all the kaupapa that we are trying to um, pull together to um, to achieve that vision for our people, for our marae, and for our organisation. Thank you. Um, these next few slides very quickly, I won't give you the detail, but we will see in the presentation out. These were designed uh, when we put together our five-year plan. Now we're in year four of our five-year plan. The reason for putting a five-year plan together was to, to give us a, um, a, a roadmap towards 2050. 2050 is a long way off. So how do we break down that journey so we've got, um, you know, we, we've got our Google Maps on the way to this amazing vision for our tribal members. Now I've got some notes on Nga Taiao. Obviously, this is a very big connector between Waikato Tainui and the Waikato Regional Council. We do a lot of collaboration in the Taiao space, fresh water, climate change, environmental standards, PC1, water allocation. So our job is to advocate, to influence, to help you develop those policies and to stand up for the rights of our awa, uh, our tupuna awa, and for our environment. So we have a program of work over the over the last three years and the next two years. 
and we're also in the in the throes of working towards the next iteration of our five year plan. Thank you, Manaki. The Harpuri space, so in the community space, um, our job again, we're trying here to um, ensure that uh, we in, can influence and advocate advocate for change in social services. For example, um, we're very excited that we will soon be announcing a major collaboration with Oranga Tamariki. Um, unfortunately, um, we have to experience the fact that our some of our children are uh, have come to the attention of Oranga Tamariki. So we've been working with them for eight years on better ways to care for our Tamariki, to connect them to their whānau hapu iwi, um, and to bring bring them back on the uh, bring them back into a safe whānau environment. There's also the work we're doing right now uh, with the with the health reforms. We also do work um, in education. So we've got an education and pathways team. Um, Last year, I think we uh, we supported 200 tribal members into employment. We're currently uh, supporting uh, in, with pastoral care a whole range of rangatahi across a range of organisations. I think we achieved about 35 apprenticeships for um, our tribal members, and um, we're always looking for good partners to help us um, keep growing uh, that part of our our mahi. Obviously, you know about our work at Te Kariere, our first housing development, and we have three other developments right now that we're working on, and hopefully we can talk to you about very soon in the future. One up in Tamaki, um, potentially two in Tamaki and one more closer to home. But yeah, that's 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 a hard road um, to hoe at the moment because everybody's in that space, but we're hopeful that we can tell you more. So that's what the Hapuri um, tohu is about. Kia ora, um, Manaki. Photos of clever people. This one is our kaupapa uh, tohu. So this is about our marae, our tūranga waiwai. We hope that all our marae are self-sufficient in places of safety, in places where you can hear our reo, where our paipai is full, where everybody knows what their job is, and you know there's a saying, if it's if it's running neat that well at the back, then the front will be taken care of. So that's what we're trying to build. We're trying to build 68 marae with the right facilities, and that's very important now as we think about the, um, the water reforms and the responsibilities that will place on our marae as suppliers uh, to the public of water. So we are working with our whānau to make sure that they understand their responsibilities. And we're also talking to the Crown about their expectations of us and how they're going to help us to make sure that we're in a good space to meet those expectations. In this space also, some of you might have been lucky enough to be invited to Rangiriri just recently, where uh, the rebuild of the trenches was opened. Um, that space is not just a, a tourist space or tourism space, social and economic development for Ngāti Naho, but it's also an educational space. So we don't want to have to be always repeating our history because our history will be well known by our by our whole community. And Rangiriri is a huge part of, of that uh, vision for our for our iwi. And we're working very closely right now with um, TPK and other agencies to get that education part kicked off at Rangiriri. Manaki. So economic development, Manaki said to you that, you know, before the settlers came, we were a very economically driven tribe. We were prosperous. We were supplying clay uh, and other goods to the, the population in Auckland. We want to build that up again for our, uh, for our tribal businesses. We want to support them through social procurement. We've delivered our social procurement strategy and we've um, presented that to you and all the councils expectation now is that you work with us to give opportunities for our tribal businesses to be successful. We want to also give those opportunities to our marae, you know, what's the economic opportunities for them through land, through tourism, through business, through culture, through arts. Um, we are big players along with yourselves and the other councils in the Hamilton to Auckland corridor work and Manaki is our, our wonderful representative in that space, um, along with other board members, Rangitā comes to mind. 
and Jackie's a big player in there too. So there's so much going on and it's right in our core, in our centre. So our job is to make sure that everybody realises this is Waikato and so Waikato, the iwi of Waikato needs to be intricately involved. Um, this is about growing wealth for our tribe, our tribal members and our marae. And the last thing I'll just point out and um, uh, Manaki uh, referred to it is our outstanding claims. We do have an outstanding harbours claim that our negotiator Rahui Papa continues to work on with our marae out on the coast. And also relativity is a very important mechanism for us because it enables us to continue to build our tribal uh, wealth and prosperity. And there's some handsome people that you might know. This last slide is really about us as an organisation and trying to uh, deliver the best services that we can for our marae and tribal members. You know, we're building on data. We know technology is the way forward. With such a young population, we need to be accessible to our population through technology. <coughs> Excuse me. We need to make our uh, information available to our marae. So that, that two-thirds of the tribal membership who are young, what are their skills? What are their capabilities? How can we involve them? How can we show them the opportunities? So we're always looking to do better um, in our space. Um, I, I think we've said this to you and other councils before, you know, there's five councils in our area, big councils, and there's one iwi. So we do struggle sometimes. So if you can share data with us, if you can share your innovation and your capability, we, we don't like reinventing wheels when the wheel's already done. So we, we're open to those sort of conversations. And again, and here's the procurement space. I think that one. Thank you, Manaki. And to finish, you mentioned all of these people today, um, and they continue to be our inspiration as we move into the 20, 20, 21st century. So we, I, I look at uh, Te Puea Herangi and her, um, her whakatauki is, if we dream together, then together we can make the dream come true. If I dream alone, it's just my dream. And that's about partnerships and collaborations. Te Araki Nui, she was well known across the, uh, way, uh, across the New Zealand and the world for the way she built relationships that are still standing to this day. And she talked to us about drawing strength from those. And that's our hope uh, with Waikato Regional Council and all our partners across Waikato. And obviously Sir Robert, who was a, a visionary. Um, I remember when it was time for us in 95 to... Everyone over 18, you had to sign the paper to say, let's get a settlement. And, and I remember uh, that decision causing huge debates in our families, um, you know, splits in our whānau because the, the, our, our kaumātua said, let's, let's follow our boss, that day the boss, let's do it. And our rangatahi going, well, hang on a minute. And, you know, uh, is this the right thing? But, you know, 30 years, 25 years on, it was the right thing to do. It's it's took such leadership to do that. And um, we're just lucky that we had amazing leaders like these. And we hope to grow more as we continue along um, our journey of, of looking after our iwi. I think that's uh, our last slide, eh, um, Manaki? So kia ora tate. we hope, as I said, it's talk about a, a whiz-bang presentation, but we hope in some way that that's given you some background uh, to where we've been and where we are today. And kia ora tato. Kia ora manaki, kia ora mara. Um, as, as you've said, you know, you could tell by the pace that Mara was talking that that was really, really rushed um, and that there's just there's so much more to express both through words and through feeling, visiting some of these places. Um, so I will hand over to, to co-chair Barry, but I did want to um, ask Chris or maybe Neville, I'm not sure who, um, but how do we ensure that there's an appropriate induction planned and included in um, the process for the incoming council, that that's adequately funded, enough uh, time is set aside, because as um, as the map shows, a big part of your region is Aorohe. Um, and, you know, you're not going to get 
to really understand that through a presentation um, on a screen, you know, we really do need to, to go and see some of these places and really um, feel the way as, as Mara has said. So it's just a question for you, Chris. Yeah, yeah thanks, Jackie. Um, good question, because, you know, obviously the, we've got a big rohi in the entire region itself with many other um, iwi that would, we'd also need to have their uh, uh, interests inducted in as well. Um, Marley, um, I think you're still in the room, are you? I can't see you, but um, you'll, you'll be sort of helping guide that induction process and we'll be taking guidance from probably our iwi partners and also uh, the, the likes of Ranga and, and others in the um, in the team to help to help guide us through, through that, Jackie. I think, Marley, I don't know if you can say about any thoughts you've really got about that induction process. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments, perhaps. Um, we are turning our mind to pulling together the induction programme now. Um, it does take uh, a, a long time to make sure that all the elements are coming together appropriately. We have had some initial discussions um, with councillors through um, a number of recent meetings, and they've certainly uh, indicated their desire to um, ensure that our iwi partners, and as Rangi Māori has said, their narratives are reflected appropriately in our induction programme. So that will be a key focus this time round. And we're really, um, it's been really useful hearing today's feedback because it has featured a couple of times um, during different kaupapa that we've discussed today, um, how important that is. And so we're really keen to take this feedback and make sure that it is reflected appropriately in our induction. Jackie, if I could just take the opportunity to thank Manaki and Mara for those presentations. Um, if I heard rightly, you might have stepped in at, uh, at short notice, but uh, really, really informative. And I think that you've pitched it at a level we can see the big picture which is a really useful start for us, um, Kapai, and uh, thank you for doing that. Yeah, uh, yes, I, I reiterate those comments. Uh, I think it's going to be very important with the incoming governors to really spell out that these forums are not just about uh, being the agent of the Crown. These forums are about an entity who has established uh, not only a mana in their region, but they are now a powerhouse that you see evolving and playing a bigger and bigger role, whether it be on the wellbeing front or with its economic development. You just got to look at Rukura. That is a game changer in terms of the economy of this region, and it will continue. So my view is that uh, there's the legal side of things that the incoming council needs to understand, but they need to understand how important engagement is with one of the most significant parties or partners in this region to make sure the region is growing and going forward. So uh, I'm keen as a governor, and I know my fellow governors are keen, that we have these learnings uh, that are able to be embedded in the new council. And we've, we've been, uh, as you know, we've been wrestling a bit with that this triennium, and now we're in a better space. Uh, we've, we've had the tensions, but now I think we're out the right side uh, to go forward quite positively. So I'm, I'm very positive about where we are now and where we're going to. Thank you. I'll just pass it over to Jen. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mara and uh, Manaki. Um, I had, remember seeing a similar presentation uh, at the start of the training or, or somewhat in, but obviously can absorb more every other time that you see it. And um, and that's where I just wanted to make the note that uh, for Mali and, and her commentary as well, that um, it would be really great to have it as part of our induction with our iwi partners right up front. Because um, I think currently there's, from a councillor's experience coming in, um, there's 
it depends a lot on your awareness of what iwi partnership means. And I came in with very little. Um, and so really wanting to make that clear distinction between iwi partners and stakeholders uh, right up front. And that means that, you know, our iwi partners are those we visit right at the very beginning before we visit other stakeholders as well. And that the, the induction or whatever that looks like is gradual. Because as I mentioned, you absorb more each time and it's a lot for some. Um, and that that's ongoing. And I'm mindful that when I first sat down in this JMA um, with Ruku at the front, um, and I remember the first thing Tippa was talking about was how the disruption happens each time when there are changes in governors on both sides. And obviously that is a way to get um, up to speed faster because I think the frustration was constantly coming up around, it's been a long time. This is the, you know, this was the first JMA and we should be further. And so anything we can do there um, is worth the investment. And I am mindful from conversations with Neville that there are uh, discussions ongoing about um, how staff might be able to um, spend some time with Waikato Tainui and vice versa. Um, and I just wanted to flag that I would think it would be really, really helpful if we could do something similar at the councillor level and obviously leave that for everyone to have a think about what that could look like. But I'm mindful that I would love to spend some time not just looking at these things on a PowerPoint, but really being in there with building relationships. But I'm also mindful that everywhere I go, I hear how um, resource constrained um, here we are, and I don't want to be a bother, uh, but I do want to be there. So if there was an agreement from both sides that is worth having a, a, a buddy system or an investment and in a couple of people um, from, from both our sides to build those relationships so that we really are cross-pollinating all the time. And that would be really cool. And I'm just saying I'm happy to put my hand up to help design something if feedback is required. So taking that as uh, from that last slide, Mara, uh, around being able then deliver more on the dreaming together, the taking the strengths from partnerships and taking the initiative like that to just step change it a bit from what we've done before. So thanks for that. Go to Jen. Fantastic suggestion, the buddy system and figuring out ways that you can yes, be, in, be part of some of the things that we do that are actually accessible. Like it doesn't have to be a you know, organised thing yeah. um, to be part of some of our tribal events, activities, experiences. Yeah, but it doesn't yeah. happen organically by itself. It does need a little bit of a nudge to say, these are the right kind of events. How about we exchange details? Or what, what, what are the two people actually interested in if they are in a buddy system? And hence, you can co-create that as you go. Yeah. Thanks. Neville has a comment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, um, my understanding is that the, some initial conversations, uh, some initial conversations have already taken place between um, Chris and Mara, and um, and I think they're both online, so they could probably confirm this or, um, is, is is correct. And in those conversations, there were discussions about creating internship pathways, secondments, and so forth. Um, between both parties to enable a deeper and more meaningful understanding of how both, both parties work and also to support career development for staff and um, their growth and progression uh, for both organisations. Um, I see Chris is probably live and can speak to it directly himself, so I'll pass over to Chris. Oh, kia ora, Neville. Um, yeah, so uh, Mara and I have had an initial conversation about that. Um, wouldn't it be great if staff from Waikato Regional Council were able to go and, uh, you know, sit um, with Waikato Tainui, you know, when, when they do their job sometimes and, and vice versa, because we see a real opportunity to sort of develop and grow together uh, some of that, the capability needs. Mara, you might like to comment further to that, but it's, it's really been initial conversation. Yeah, very, very... Um very initial. Um, look, we're very aware of the um, of the desire to work together on this, and I just think we need to have an opportunity to 
Yeah, pull, pull all the brainy people. I see some of them on the screen over there, Marley and Neville, and, and sit down and fig, figure this out, figure how we're going to do it. Within the context of RMA reforms, water reforms, resource constraints, but it is very important. So, look, we'll, I'll, I'll talk to our team and then you talk to yours, Chris, and we'll figure something out, co-chairs. Kia ora tato. I have to go to another hui aroha mai. Kia ora mara. Kia ora. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you and Manaki, for your ability to just jump in and you know, fill in and pro provide a really excellent presentation. So thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to, to add that um, it's not just the iwi authority that council should be trying to connect with. You know, so connecting with our people who do this mahi day in, day out on the ground is almost more important, I think, um, in terms of understanding the challenges and the opportunities that exist out there in Te Taio and how it links with the regional council. Um, and I can think of a few of those groups that are doing that work day in, day out, um, that would benefit from having a direct relationship with regional council as opposed to through um, us as an iwi authority. Norman. Um, kia ora, Jackie. Um, I just want to make a point about le leadership and, and every time I see that presentation, it, it sort of gets my fire and my belly going because we stand on the giants of yesteryear and yeah, we acknowledge the leadership, um, but there's also the other leaders that are still around and I, and I speak to the hearts and likes of Shane Solomon and John Temaru, um, Tipa uh, being, being, um, being that, that group of leaders who, who help the leaders get a leaderful uh, out outcome. And so every time I see their presentation, it reminds me of a, actually a presentation from a, from a, from a, um, a, a young um, uh, student from Te Whare Manga, where she talked about the amount of land and assets that we've taken and what we got back. And she aligned it to the, to the door and what we got back, what was taken was the door and what we got back was the doorknob. And so the relativity of scale um, makes it really easy to understand in terms of that loss. But what it brings us to now is um, what opportunities uh, are, are real and, and leadership, the role of leadership and, and what that plays in it. So we talk about te mana o te wai, uh, mana whenua, uh, ahika. I think ahika has been used in this forum a number of times, uh, uh, Pam. And the connection with ahika is actually whakapapa. And when you have whakapapa to the whenua, the area, you have ahika rua. And so when we talk about that, uh, leadership is at the tribal level. And I just want to make a plug for um, Manaki and Mara. Boy, oh boy, they're at every who doing this great mahi. And I just want to acknowledge them um, because, uh, you know, they, they do what they need to do on those um, shoulders of giants of yesteryear. And so when we talk about leadership, there's leadership at the tribal authority level, but there's also hapu leadership. There's actually marae leadership. And um, I know many years ago when I was the manager back home in Lahui Pukeka, we used to have uh, Gannon and Rama Ormsby used to come and actually meet with us uh, regularly. And um, I think the people in Lahui Pukeka would love to meet the new uh, Po Tuhono. Uh, <laughs> we put the invitation uh, to her to, um, to meet their whānau potentially. And so it's those types of relationships that organically through natural attrition called mahi. And so when we're having our hui at those RMA reform hui, uh, no, uh, lower Waikato catchment hui, you know, we'd love to see the chiefs of this place, chief to chief, face to face, to actually meet the other leaders and they're not necessarily at the tribal authority in this forum. Uh, there's many others and Glenn Tupuhi and, and Horiawa and others who, who sit at that level. It'd be good to make that connection and to give mana, whenua tanga, ki te mana whakahaere i tō tātano ake taonga. So I just wanted to uh, uh, put that on the table in terms of an induction. And I think an induction is actually going to meet them, having a, a scone and a cup of tea or a little on a bread uh, with a golden syrup um, to have a kōrero. Because I think that's what an induction is, other than a formal thing. It's naturally a chief to chief, face to face, over a little on a bread and a kinners uh, and oysters, uh, hopefully. And that's where you actually feel, hear, and taste the narrative and the story. And that's what a cultural induction means uh, to me. Good on. Norman. I guess with that, I wonder if we can get a mover. Oh, just, Donald. Just in addition, kia ora. Um, kia ora, Norman. Yeah, I share the same sentiments in that um, I was just looking at the action list and 
looking at how we're demonstrating at these levels. And I think the discussion we had last time with Mali and the um, the tours and, and how, how does um, this get um, what? intentional and, and deliberate? So how do we create this deliberate relationship? And sometimes in the in the tours and in the statements of the committees, um, that gives direction. And you know, it's just like going and having a cup of tea, like with Nan, hey, but you're coming out to meet the collective people there. And what's good is like what Norman says is it's kind of there. Um, and then and, and they'll be there. And it is it's really about trust and fuck up. Is that if the people can see that they trust you and, and you're you're willing to come to meet. And and I think this is probably across all cultures. Um that um, you know, we're iwi manaki and we like to see who we're actually working with and dealing with and go and ask the questions. Uh, you know, like if something doesn't sit well with you. Um, that you can actually ask them, okay, actually, but I heard you say this. Is that what you really believe? Uh, you, you know, and and but have the create that create that space. So we're deliberate in the intent of well-being, because the well-being actually comes from like what Norman's saying is, is is it's the it's where we are sitting in our mindset, and are we are we willing to to take the journey together, because we're in a journey space at the moment moving forward. And so looking for strategies and so, you know, I agree and support Norman um, that everyone here, even on the call, have got something to contribute. And if we actually sit here and contribute to construct the strategy and then um, undertake that in an action, then that's huge. Okay, that's, that's huge. So I'd just like to um, proud to be, you know, um, and, and a descendant of a lot of those ones. Um, that we talk about because, like Norm says, like they've said, it was really about the well-being. Eh? It was about the well-being. This has always been about well-being for everybody. My friends that come from the four corners of the earth, how do we do this together? And we need to sit and meet and talk, and not just at these tables. If it's at these tables, then we need to construct intent within our own protocols and procedures to be deliberate in that. And so I do support the quarter that Norm said and everyone, because well-being is the kotahitanga. Thank you, Ora. Jocelyn. Oh, kia ora. Um, just I was probably wasn't going to say anything because I wrote a lot down, but um, I might take it from a different perspective as well to tag on to that. Um, yes, we can provide information and do a partnership, but then we have to look at the willingness of the participants um, in both areas. So, um, and I understand as a current entity, there is an obligation um, to acknowledge um, Māori and te ao Māori, but um, I guess for me, I uh, would like to see the tangible outcomes and um, the, we can, you can do that leadership, but then it's the leadership to help filter it down. So my understanding, having been a, a government employee, is that yes, this is a time that people uh, or agencies are moving towards it. However, there's always going to be a, a roadblock. So um, we're coming in when we talk about cultural inductions, and I'm glad that's been discussed because um, I know that I brought it up quite um, politely within our own group, but um, in reality, you can work with you know it's good to see some of the whanau, um names up there I'm not going to say who but kia ora Johnny um, but in terms of getting our own people in these positions you talk about trust then let us be the faces of what what you're trying to um, promote uh, being you know um, from Waikato Tainui and sitting in these positions alongside a crown entity is where I see the trust being most formed but if we don't have that um, knowledge from the beginning or that support or that trickling down, I don't see it progressing and then we end up in a circle. Um, I was I was raised to um, not, to be honest, to not to speak that off so that I can bring whatever I learn back to my people. It's now the time that we turn it, that we uh, start looking at living in Te Ao Māori, so then they can learn and take it back to their people. So I'd like to see it progress more in terms of the information about um, the cultural induction, I did say as well, 
and it's good to see that that presentation being done. Um, yep, it should have been done first. Uh, it's, it's quite powerful, um, but uh, yeah, I guess that still it still shows that we're at a very very early learning phase, which is uh, for me. Um, you know, we came Norman and I came in at the last minute. This stuff, I'm sorry, should have been progressed a lot sooner. Um, how do we do that now? And um, yeah, so as I said, I'm, I'm bringing a, a different perspective, but it's just to, I guess, more um, push for kanui ki te kanui for our people. So you have people already in the system to so start using their knowledge. And um, I guess, how do you wait or how do you even acknowledge um, people with te ao Māori within the council now? Is it, you know, is it measured against, because I know KPIs when it comes to positions, is it even measured? That's, that's the question. That's a, a very good question, and it, does, it doesn't get measured deliberately at this point in time, but we obviously do have the roles within uh, within the organisation to have a specific focus on kaupapa Māori, and they all sit under Māli, as opposed to Honua and the team uh, um, Tairanga Whenua, uh, performs um, guidance and provides guidance and leadership for the organisation. And one of those key fo focus areas right now is a cultural competency assessment of the entire organisation. The people in the team and members across the staff across the organisation are co-designing and councillors are co collectively designing how that framework will be implemented. Uh, we're really excited about it. Uh, we think it'll be a robust process and it will form a baseline uh, against which we can then deliberately target our growth program so that we can develop our capability and competency. That will include um, te reo, it will include um, deeper knowledge of tikanga, uh, iwi across the rohe, and um, what is our responsibilities and um, how we just continue to uh, grow and mature in that space. So uh, hopefully that gives you some confidence, but we are committed to that and equally doing our work with our councillors around uh, te, te riti training, um, as uh, Rangi Māori spoke to earlier. So it's a comprehensive approach and one that we're, um, you know, we're really, we're, we're learning. We're learning. Kapai. Yeah, kapai, thank you. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. I understand that that's, that's the mahi in progress, but as I said, it's still a progress. So um, hopefully when the next um, block come in, it's going to be miles ahead. Go to Jocelyn. Look, to me, I think it, it speaks to the importance of embedding um, historical knowledge and understanding and values in the organisation because presentations like what was um, provided today, they've been provided around here, but if, but you know, our faces will change. Um, a lot of the people doing the mahi, they're enduring and consistent, so it really needs to be locked in through the organisation and part of the everyday business and approach of the council. So same as, you know, reaching out and having a consistent um, approach to engaging with our kaitiaki on the ground. You know, that's not just to come and have a cup of tea because, you know, we're new and then never see you again for another three years. It's, uh, you know, how is that embedded in the, the practice of council business? And it's not just regional council. It's, you know, all of our partners. But I do, I do like the point that, um, that Jocelyn's made around um, valuing, I guess, that mātauranga Māori expertise that our people bring to the table and the relationships that, and connections that they have, not just with the people, but the whenua that we are operating within. Um, so just, you know, again, acknowledge my cousin from Tanifa Marae, um, Johnny Kenny. <laughs> yeah. but, it, but it is really important. Um, so I guess just don't want to lose the action, and I think Donald... Um, described it really well, you know, how does council become more deliberate and intentional in the way that it engages with our people out there? Um, like, because we only meet quarterly, but it's, you know, how, how do we make sure that that's part of your business? Um, and, like, I'd re be really keen to understand, maybe for it through Neville or Chris, what changes, if any, do you think need to happen to make that just part of BAU? Um, you know, is it a point? Is it engage, uh, employing more people in that space, making sure that there's adequate putia available for those people to be out there 
making those connections and maintaining those connections. And on the flip side, making sure that there's enough resource available to support our people out there doing the mahi, um, spending time with, with your staff. Maybe as an action, I'm very conscious of, of time, um, but if you've got an initial response, Neville, we'll take that. Otherwise, note that as an action. I'm not sure if Chris wants to respond on the putia side of things, but on the um, staff uh, development, um, you know, just building on the corridor earlier around the competency assessment, um, Marley and I just had a quick catch about what might that mean. And um, one, it is about attracting people and reflecting it in job descriptions and having a process around attracting the right people, the right skill sets to, to enable the organisation to do better. Um, but it's also about building that competency with an existing staff so that those natural conversations, those considerations around what, what um, are beyond statutory minimums that we need to be cognisant of and to make the processes more um, organic, more streamlined, more natural, as opposed to probably a more mechanical approach that we've been adopting over time. We have improved in that respect, but um, I think, and reflecting the feedback heard so far from our mana whenua representatives, um, is seeking a more um, a, a broader, more lateral approach with um, broader engagement um, with the people on the ground. And so part of that is bringing the right people off on the ground into the organisation, but also building the capability within our existing staff to, to undertake that naturally um, and not being reliant on one or two individuals to carry the burden. Um, it will take time, but that is our direction of travel. And I see Chris is, uh, is, is online, so you might want to add to that. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, great corridor and a, a, a nice challenge as to how far we can go, how fast, uh, sort of making the whole system of, of our partnership work better. And as I said before, we've got that with other iwi in our rohi as well. But we are having conversations um, uh, with the central government about this because it's a, um, I think they recognise with some of the extra mahi that needs to be done that we all need to be involved with. Um, that you know, Eugene Ber uh, Berryman Camp, who of course is now in the in Ministry for the Environment, um, we're having conversations there to see if we can find ways of um, upping our resourcing to sort of be able to um, have a better connectedness with with uh, Waikato Tainui and other iwi. And uh, Jackie, um, I, I I hope that uh, you and the team, are at, I believe you are having a similar kōrero from from from. Uh, your perspectives as well. Um, and I think that's a challenge that we're going to be able to give to our governors to say, well, how much uh, resource um, can we uh, uh, get to put into this going forward? Um, yes, uh, some of the things you see um, to me are very significant uh, as a governor. And one of the things we did, you might think it's relatively small, but coming to this building and changing the way we worked uh, in terms of interacting, in terms of the executive leadership team and being embedded in the, the all of those at every, every level. It's actually the engagement is now uh, more of a platform approach rather than a hierarchy. Uh, and even the governors can move in that space. So what's happened is, and this is just an observation, the fact that mali has been promoted up to a level of engagement at a much higher level, to me, has been a significant change in the way that influence is starting to uh, emerge through parts of our organisation. I saw that personally as a, as a significant step. And Mully has a full confidence of all of the governors, as does the ELT and Neville and so on. So we're seeing a, a move, a, a change from a governor point of view. And the governors, I think, are, a little, are more open to those directions. But we are on a journey. And uh, we're, we're working, we talk, um, Chris, I like, Chris is, talks about one team. That's my philosophy too. The idea that governors and staff, um, some people see them as working quite separate, but my view is that governors and staff have to be more entwined in terms of 
the outcomes and the directions that we're trying to achieve. Uh, so that's the direction I'm seeing us go. And I think we're we're going in the right direction. Yes, we could probably run a bit faster, but uh, I know um, governors, the ones I've spoken to, are certainly committed to driving in that direction. And uh, thank you for cheering what has been a great hui today. Uh, I've really valued all the comment commentary. Thank you. Got a co-chair. Donald. I just, just oh, one last thing. Um, maybe, maybe it's it's that would like to. I was just thinking, there are teams that are doing really awesome stuff. Um, you know, collaborating from regional council with Marae, um, and maybe having a a part of successes. You know, really, you know, projects that, that allows the teams that under maybe WRC, um, the different projects. That if they have the opportunity, maybe to share, you know, some successful things that they're doing with Marae or with um, different lots of mana whenua to be brought into the space, because sometimes there's a whole lot of work that we don't actually know that's happening. And it's really successful, and sometimes saying some of this stuff sort of doesn't give that justice. And so I'm just thinking about, you know, is there a space, you know, in in, in here so that we can see here, acknowledge and build off that. That's a thought. Kia ora. Yes, taking that thought one step further, Don, I wonder if there's an opportunity for us to go out and have a look at some of the mahi, um, because I'm, I know that some of it is being done in partnership with, with our mana whenua. Um, so if there's um, an appetite for regional council to organise something like that uh, in the next few months, I think that would be excellent. Norman. Um, uh, and so um, there are some real champion examples of exemplars that are working on the ground and I use the Kimi here Lake uh, project as one of those and uh, Pam was uh, great to have um, uh, you at the at the blessing because you met our leader uh, Taitumu there and you met Johnny and the team who are kaimahi doing the mahi and our other partners the Tim Foys and others and so with the efforts and leadership from the council through through the funding arrangements to get the preacher in order to to deliver this outcome, it'll be fantastic to present. But actually go and have a look at what's taking place, what's being shaped in terms of that um, example, and have a cup of tea with the locals because that's a real good pilot or exemplar that one could use as a platform to really mirror uh, that engagement at that level, chief to chief, face to face, looking at co partnership or engagement in terms of um, restoring the mode of uh, of the lake, which in turn is in achieving Te Mana o Te Awa. I think that's a real good example, um, which can be organised pretty quickly. There's some great work happening here right now. So is that something you can make happen, Chris? So this is Regional Council organising a, a bit of a tour of a couple of exemplar projects in the Waikato over the next yeah. couple of months. Look, I'm, I'm I'm sure we could, and equally, I'm I'm sure maybe from my couple of Tainui end that could uh, you know, something could be arranged as well. But when you were talking about that, Jackie uh, and 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 Don and Norm, you know, what was coming into my mind is the the great hui that we had at uh, Tanifa Marae, your at your Marae, uh, for one of the shovel ready projects uh, early on, and that was a great showcase and it was a great opportunity to come together, and. I, I absolutely see the value in what's being suggested instead of just sitting around the table talking about stuff, actually going out and um, and seeing it and meeting with the people who are involved and in, in, in getting the feel for it. I think it's a wonderful idea. So that's a, an action to take away sometime in the next, well, for that to happen in the next couple of months. So with that, um, seeking a mover, to receive the presentation. Jen, seconded, Jocelyn, all in favour? Right. Um, we're way over time, so I'm just going to feel the room. It has been good. It has been good. Um, it's amazing because you see sort of two agenda items and you think, oh, it's going to be really fast. <laughs> <That's what they're laughs> um, so Marley suggested, um, and I'll you know read the uh, read the membership that we receive the update um, rather than go go through it. But I've got one request 
and that is um, to request a briefing for those of us who are interested from the regional council staff on the various policy reviews that are going on, out, like a briefing outside of today, um, just so we can find out more about how those are progressing, who's involved, and just follow up on some parts I that I had on the actions list. That would be okay. But Norman, who supports that? Tracy, who's a bit more oh, another hui. I, I would prefer a briefing separate, but that's okay. Good point. Right. So with that, can I get a mover to receive the action list? Donald, second Norm. All in favour? Aye. Right. So I think that brings us to the end of our agenda. I'll pass it over to you, Mr. Co Chair, uh, if you've got any thank comments. Thank you. Just final comments. Uh, I really have um, learned a lot through this process. Even engaging, uh, fronting up to this committee, to me uh, and to the iwi, and being able to put forward messages which are, to me, very significant in the way we're going to move forward. Uh, so I hope you've all found that, um, that we are committed and we're committed uh, to move forward in a more engaging way. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the future in that respect. Thank you to my co-chair, he's done a marvellous job, uh, and uh, I wish you all well. Thank you. Co-chair. And just invite the members if you've got any closing remarks that you'd like to make before... Asking Don to close our hui. You don't have to. PowerPoint. Kia ora. Over to you, Don. Kia ora. Enjoyed the uh, enjoyed the corridor sitting together. Um, and nice to meet you in your new role, Mr. Chair. Um, but I'd like to sort of ask Norman, would you like to fuck a copy to Tato? Not if I not if I could keep Atena <laughs> I've just been told that I need to declare that the hui is closed. <laughs>